Peru, so just south of Rumford. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, my God. I can't believe it. <laughs> like, well, for you. When do you get to pick your, your, I don't know, your sidekick? My, like, my... What are you supposed to do to not fog your glasses? Oh, I don't know. I haven't figured that one out. <laughs> There's gotta be a. It's gonna be a long. Leanne, can you hear us? Leanne. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I can't hear Leanne either. Awesome. KT? I can hear you guys. All right. Leanne doesn't look like she can hear, hear us. I almost asked if Diane could hear us, but I realized she's over there. <laughs> and, she just, and she just said, <laughs> what? <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> yeah, exactly.
can't hear anyone. We can hear you. Can you hear us? Oh, yep. Now I can hear there you. you are, Leah. I don't know what happened. I disappeared. Um, thank you, everybody. Sorry as we try to work through uh, a few changes here on the school board meeting for tonight, Thursday, August 20th. If I could please have tonight's attendance. Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. And Mr. Bennett? Here. Excellent. If you could please join me for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. I believe there's only one adjustment to tonight's agenda. I'd like to move item 6.2 to 6.1, um, and that would be having Dr. Fanberg speak to us. Are there any other adjustments that anyone would like to make tonight? Okay, excellent. Seeing none, um, looking for public comment. This is gonna be a little different as we work through this part. Um, I can't see the podium, so I'm going to ask Diane if somebody is at the podium to let me know. Um, and then we will try to go between that with what we received for um, emails as well as folks that may be on the Zoom for tonight. So starting with the folks in the room, is there anyone at podium? No, there's nobody at the podium. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. See if there's anyone with hands. Oh, we have somebody with their hands up. Two. Okay. Crystal, for some reason, I cannot promote you. Um, Diane, if you could bring her over, I am so sorry. I think I lost my host privileges when I got bounced. I just want to make sure you can hear me. I can hear you. Great. Thank you. Um, good evening, board. Uh, my name is Crystal Ash Cuthbert. I live in Wyndham and have taught Scarborough children for over 25 years. Tonight I'm speaking on behalf of the educators of this district as the president of the Scarborough Education Association. After gathering much information from the staff through direct communications as well as surveys, the SEA is unable to support the district's plan to reopen in the fall. There are far too many questions left unanswered, decisions unmade, and concerns unaddressed. Over 62% of the staff do not believe or are unsure that the district should even reopen to in-person instruction. 47% are opposed to it completely based on the information they have received thus far. A third of the staff has seriously considered an early retirement, taking a year's leave of absence, or leaving their jobs completely. Nearly 50% don't feel it's safe for students and staff to return to school buildings. The educators and support staff have concerns about student safety when moving to, from, and within the school buildings. There are still questions unanswered about students' privacy during live streaming. 56 employees are considered high risk according to the CDC guidelines, and another 60 are living with someone in their households that are also at high risk. There are concerns about the amount of screen time that is being required of students due to schoolwork. In the event of a positive diagnosis within a building or an outbreak district wide, we wonder if there will even be enough substitutes to cover classrooms. We do not believe that there are an adequate number of custodians to clean to the extent that the CDC recommends. Thus far, employees have not found the district's administration flexible to the individual accommodations that their doctors have requested on their behalf. They feel anxious, overwhelmed, and angry, but most of all, they feel unheard. In the past, educators have sounded the alarm to ill-informed and short-sighted initiatives and have not been listened to. For example, standards-based grading or later start times. And while those things were divisive in our community and a heated debate, debate 
They were not life-threatening. Reopening the schools with so many critical decisions left to be made is irresponsible and dangerous. To reiterate, the SEA at this time cannot support the district's reopening plan as it currently stands. The association leadership would welcome being a part of decision-making process that, so that all staff, students, and their families would feel safe to return to in-person instruction. Thank you. Thank you. Brittany, you just need to bring yourself from being on mute. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so um, thank you for taking me on. I was going to start tonight from a parent perspective, but to echo what Crystal just said, um, I'm gonna start off from a school staff perspective. Um, as you may know, I've reached out to the board and the superintendent, along with multiple people in the school staff and administration about my concerns to return to try, um, school. Um, mainly my concern with my daughter and the remote learning. Um, I received very lack of communication back on this. One clarifying email from Kelly Crosby at Wentworth School. Um, my supervising teacher was very supportive. Other than that, I have not heard, uh, I did hear from the superintendent. Um, I would share his email, I can share that email. Um, I think he maybe missed the point of what I was actually asking in the email. Um, so yeah, communication is just not there, A. Um, B, from what I've heard from uh, administration when asked, you know, where did the teachers stand on this? They don't know. Um, teachers don't really support this at all. Um, you know, we don't know. Are we going to have nine kids in in-person learning and nine kids on a screen that we're attending to and we're making these arrangements while teachers are still you know on vacation not getting paid and not able to maybe stand up and voice where they are on this i know as um, a school staff member i am 95 percent sure i will not return to scarborough schools um and that just, you know, that's really sad. I, I love Scarborough schools. I feel like I'm a great staff. I've received um, nothing but outstanding reports on all reviews and evaluations. I've made great relationships and I'm just sad and disappointed, truly. Um, yeah, so that being said on the staff part, as a, um, as a parent, I'd like to hear more on the mask breaks. It was briefly mentioned that um, maybe every 30 minutes. I'm wondering how that would look and, um, you know, affect in instruction, getting the kids up. We heard that specials will be going to the classroom, so the kids are going to be in the same four walls. Um, and uh, we only have 10 minutes of transition time built in, and that's unrealistic for these kids to be carrying all this stuff to go out of the, you know, it's just, this all is not realistic. It should have been much clearly better communicated to the teachers and the staff. Um, I thank Crystal for supporting um, the staff at this time. And um, I don't think I stated it, but I'm also a resident, a resident at 34 Glendale Circle, Scarborough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we did receive a public comment via email. And that's from Marla Zambo. Good evening, Board of Education members. Thank you for your time and commitment to Scarborough schools, staff, and students. We have chosen Scarborough schools remote learning for the first term of the school year. We will reassess as the new term approaches. Having statistics concerning the number of cases of COVID-19 amongst staff and students will be a key consideration of whether we send our children to school for in-person instruction. Will the school district be sharing information concerning COVID-19 cases in Scarborough schools with the community? Perhaps a report could be generated and shared with the Board of Education members at each of their regularly scheduled meetings. A report which includes a total number of cases and a breakdown by school and or grade and whether a student or staff member was diagnosed. It would be helpful to us as we determine whether we want to continue with remote learning or have our children attend in person. If these statistics will be shared, please also determine how the public would have access to this information. Hopefully it would be in an easy to access location. We appreciate all you do for the Scarborough community. Thank you for your time, Marla Sando. 
Okay, just need it one more second and see if anyone else has public comment. Okay, seeing none. Moving into the superintendent's report. Um, 6.1 is now an overview of the school's opening with Dr. Fanberg. So before Dr. Fanberg um, begins, I just want to thank him very much for uh, being in attendance with us tonight. Um, he has been a huge supporter uh, and uh, he is our district physician. We, our nurse staff meets with him on a regular basis and um, since this pandemic has started, uh, that work that has been happening with Dr. Fanberg has uh, been uh, accelerated and much more close. Um, so we are pleased to have him speak tonight. Dr. Fanberg, if you could talk to us uh, about COVID-19. I know that not only are you a practicing pediatrician, but you're also on some important state boards and uh, have much that you could share with us. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Dan. So I'm John Fanberg. I'm a pediatrician. I'm also an adolescent medicine subspecialist. I work at Maine Medical Center at the South Portland site. And I've been the school physician for Scarborough Schools for a couple of years now. Um, and, and in that role, I've worked with the school nurses when topics come up, as well as some periodicity, and how do we improve the health of the population in general. And this is a spin for everybody, um, for what we're used to, um, the, the COVID problem. And it's been a change for practicing physicians, it's changed for what we do day to day in our lives, and it's changed for how we get educated as well. But the fortunate thing I can say is that we have one of the lowest prevalences of COVID in the United States, in the state of Maine. And as little as that might seem as a number, a 0.7% prevalence, um, that is incredible valuable uh, because risk of everything becomes less um, because of that prevalence. Um, However, it still means we need to be cautious and careful as far as how we reopen schools. Uh, and it means that we need to be um, protective and safe in how we do it as well. Uh, so um, what we've been doing with school nurses over the last two months, um, I participate with a group of uh, school physicians, about 10 of us from around the state, as well as school nurses, about 10 around the state, the main CDC and Department of Education. We've looked at uh, how to get back to school, um, how can we do it safely? What do we do when people are sick? Um, how do we manage them uh, from going back to school once they've been sick? Uh, the biggest thing I can say as far as intervention is self-assessment at home before you get to school. And that's changing how we do things. You used to have a runny nose. You might have had a headache. You might have shipped your kid off to school. This year, we need to stop, think twice, look at the symptoms, potentially stay home more so. Uh, and that's a shift in how we're doing things. Beyond that, uh, the face coverings is, is the most important thing I can see if you're going to school. And the face coverings, as much time as you can have with a face covering as possible is gonna be a critical facet for um, keeping uh, safe along those lines. Um, hand hygiene is a critical piece if I was to rank down my tiers of options as far as how it keeps safety um, in place. And hand hygiene has been proven with this virus that it can be simple soap and water, washing your hands, or it can be the squirt gels. It can be any form along those lines, but they're effective. And then the physical distancing plays a role uh, as far as that. Um, we know those are the core principles that are important to maintaining safety. And we wanna apply those as much as we can. Um, does that remove risk all uh, completely? No, um, this is risk mitigation more than risk reduction or removal. Uh, that um, we will re reduce the risk as far as we possibly can through all these interventions uh, as, as we apply them as much as we can. I also say um, there's risks of not going back to school as well. And we know that uh, teens and kids have been affected me from a mental health standpoint. Uh, there's educational delays, there's social delays that are being occurring. There's food insecurity issues and there's uh, things like PTSD that's four times higher with people who are quarantined versus people who are not quarantined. Um, so we need to effectively look at that risk as well while we're considering what we do. Diane, I'm happy to take specific questions or um, where to go from here, you let me know. Can you hear me right now? We can hear you. We can hear you, we can't hear the board chair. She's muted. Okay. Isn't it? There you go. Yeah. 
Well, Again, you think of, I had never done Zoom before. Um, for folks in the board, if you do have questions, I'm just going to ask if you can raise your hand where you're not in Zoom. I won't see it popping up on um, the screen as I normally do. So that would probably be the easiest way, and I will do my best to make sure we keep everybody in order. Does anybody have questions for Dr. Fanberg? Alicia? Given the fact that, um, you know, I think that in the best of times, there are parents who are hard pressed for child care when, especially when they have their own employment issues and, um, you know, sometimes kids are sent to school inappropriately. And if we're relying on the parents to monitor um, their children before coming to school safely, is there, is there a, do you have a recommendation in the event that that's not happening? Is there, is there like a second tier that we can be doing that's not so burdensome that um, time-wise that it takes out of the instructional day? You hit the nail with a hammer on the head. Uh, this is a problem, okay? We're gonna have more home time than we had in previous years because of mild illness. We're gonna have um, kids, once they get uh, sent home, they might be home for longer periods before they came back. And this is a problem for single parents. It's a problem for parents who have to work. It's parents for a problem for daycare. I don't have a solution for all those things. I do know we need to be a team and partnering as far as um, keeping the school safe and keeping everybody safe. And that means self-reporting, not just at whether your kid goes to school or not to start with, but if somebody's asked to leave school because of symptoms, uh, the state's recommending that you touch base with your physician, uh, either over the phone or something before you go back and get a letter from the physician and they put together protocols that the pediatrician offices in the state will be adhering to uh, as far as the basis for when to go back. Um, and so there's more steps to go back. There's more step reasons for staying home. Uh, and yes, this is a problem, but this is the safety that we deal with. Um, the question is how are we gonna be able to um, flip over to some sort of education if somebody's going home so they don't completely lose education during those timeframes. Um, as far as the core symptoms, you know, it, we're going to be, be advertised to the parents. I think we are probably already have put together brochures that have been um, developed by the state, uh, but it's related to new onset headache, muscle aches, nasal discharge, congestion, nausea. Those are mild symptoms. And if you have more than two of those types of symptoms, we think that's significant. Uh, opposed to major symptoms might be fever, new uncontrolled cough, sore throat, or lack of taste or smell. And those core symptoms are even more significant we're gonna potentially be doing testing for with more frequency as well. Uh, throughout the state, there's been a big effort in the last month to develop testing centers that can do asymptomatic kids as well as low symptomatic kids and remove as many barriers as we can to get the testing done and done it quickly. Um, there's movements toward how can we move towards anterior nasal or front of the nose type swabs versus the deep type of nose things uh, to the nasal pharyngeal. Um, uh, but we're trying to make this doable as well as safe. Okay. Comment just on the side about anxiety, because I think that's a real thing for everybody. Uh, it's a real thing for, it's a real thing for the par parents. It's a real thing for kids. It's a real thing for physicians. Okay? And, and um, I can, I'm in the fortunate position or unfortunate position where the medical world dealt with us in February and March. We had high, high anxiety about going back to our offices. And we started to see the patients. We couldn't just send them home and disappear. And, and the patients at that point were the sickest patients out there as well. Um, but we learned how to be safe. We learned to wear our masks as much as we can, if not 100%. Uh, we were using hygiene on our hands left and right. We were keeping our distance, but I still need to look in the ears and listen to lungs. And so there was a limited amount of time that, could, uh, that was close by people. Um, and we had to keep things as best we could along those lines. What we learned over time, though, is we got more comfortable with the state we're in, and we got more comfortable with managing day-to-day -day life in a different way, staying safe at the same time. Uh, as schools are going back, pediatricians at least are getting anxious because we're going to get a lot more phone calls with both trivial as well as very important questions at the same time and how to manage that in our offices, but we feel more resilience this time around uh, with the surge that we're expecting. Um, and in part, that's because we've gotten used to it in part and we've learned to manage it um, within our own staff and with our own selves as well. Okay. Hillary? Um, I have a question regarding um, if a student or teacher is sick. Um, I guess it's two parts. What, what is the recommendation in terms of their close contacts 
Um, and it just just in terms of them being sick enough to go home, and then um, what is how does that recommendation change if they were to be tested and were positive? Yeah. So there's some very specific guidelines that that group of uh, school physicians and school nurses put together with the CDC and Department of Education. And specifically, and those guidelines were guidelines. So each uh, town can choose differently. Uh, pediatricians like myself, my, like myself and others on this group were hoping that every town accepts it and every pediatrician accepts the same guidelines because it makes it easier for everybody. Uh, but um, as I mentioned, that there's low risk symptoms, uh, such as the headache and muscle aches. If you have two or more of those, um, you're expected to stay home until you're 24 hours uh, of improving symptoms. And you touch base with your physician, your physician hopefully sends a note to the school saying it fits what we're thinking. Um, and that might not be a physical assessment with a physician, it might be just a phone call. Um, there's the high risk symptoms such as the uncontrolled cough, the fevers, the lack of taste smell, in which case um, one's expected to either get a COVID test um, or get a evaluation by a physician and find some other diagnosis like strep or pneumonia or something like that. Um, and in those two type of settings, you would end up going back to school when you're afebrile for more than 24 hours without ibuprofen or Tylenol, when your symptoms are improving and the test result has come back if there was a test as part of it or a diagnosis was made. Um, and then there's the person who might be positive for COVID or the person who you couldn't get a test for whatever reason um, and an assessment didn't find anything that was abnormal on it. Um, for COVID positive patients, the recommendation is actually you're staying home for 10 days. And at that point, uh, if you've been afebrile for more than 24 hours, your symptoms are improving and you have approval by the CDC, the state of Maine, then you go back to school at that point. Um, and so those are the guidelines that are being put forth by the state. And I believe most pediatricians, if not all pediatricians, will be following. As far as um, notification or tracking uh, within a classroom, uh, if somebody's positive, uh, there will be uh, reasons for uh, potentially quarantining other people in the classroom. Uh, the definition of an exposure is if you've been within six feet of someone for more than 15 minutes to known COVID positive person. And if that exists, um, the recommendation from the CDC is actually that you're quarantined for 14 days. Uh, they do recommend you get tested, but even if your test is negative, you're still quarantined for 14 days um, for a known positive exposure. Um, and that will upset things if we have positives in our school rooms. Uh, uh, I come back to my first statement I started with. We have the lowest prevalence of, of COVID in the um, United States, or one of the lowest uh, states for COVID presently. Um, and that's something that hopefully puts us uh, in a setting where we're not uh, quarantining lots of people. Can I just follow up on that? Um, so I, I'm, I'm very grateful that we're so low, but just in thinking ahead, if um, there were to be anything that changes, um, what, like, I guess, say the state is still green or yellow, like what would necessitate like a single school closing? Um, I think like, would, it, sorry, go ahead. If, if there's a, a positive in a school or multiple positives, the CDC is gonna assess each one of those situations separately. Okay. And they make a recommendation, and then the school would make that decision whether they accept or decline that recommendation. Okay, perfect, thank you. Alicia? So, I mean, we're, I think we're asking the parents to monitor the children, but at some point, the, we're also going to be asking the teachers to monitor the children, right? So are they, like, have you trained the nurses to then go train the teachers, and are the teachers going to be um, up to speed about what they should do in terms of, if, if I understand you correctly, somebody's coughing, then that's a, a high risk symptom and they should be sent home. And this has been the exact focus of the last couple of meetings with the school nurses at Scarborough um, when they've been meeting as far as what to do when somebody made it through that first filter of home uh, monitoring or home uh, screening. And they actually got into the school, they show up in the classroom, the teacher hears that cough and says, that's not your asthma cough or that congestion sound is not your typical uh, allergy runny nose. Um, that person would be sent down to the nurse's office. Uh, the nurse's offices right now are setting up uh, both a well side and sick side. Uh, they're setting up mechanisms for how they handle those patients, um, how they quarantine those patients, as might be, uh, that how they control infectious control within those um, dirty sites as well. 
Um, if kids need nebulizers, that's one of the big things we're trying to move people over to and meter dose puffers instead because of risk aerosolization. Uh, we're looking at could those be done outside versus inside the building. Um, the, so those little things to risk mitigate the best we can uh, are important. And then we're also looking at um, protection stuff for the school nurses should they come across somebody who's a higher risk person so they don't become a vector for other people as well. Thank you. Nick? So I, I, I'm sure all the members of the board share this with me. I've been giving this a lot of thought, obviously, over the last couple of weeks and, and hearing what I've heard so far tonight, both in public comment and hearing what's been said now. The first thing that pops into my head is that this condition mimics a lot of other conditions that are going to be seasonally normal. And you touched on a couple of those. You talked about allergies. You talked about you know, asthma, the common cold, all those things that students come to school with all the time. And, and I guess that combined with the obvious apprehension that our staff have, and I don't know how widespread that is. We heard from several members of our staff and we heard a lot of statistics that I'm not fast enough to type to write down. Um, and I'd like to actually kind of get an idea of what the end value was for that data. But I guess my concern is, and my thought is, when I think about our students, which is of course our primary mission as board members and as district leadership and all of us really, is, is all of this worth it? And I say that as, as lightly as I can. I mean, is students coming to school two days a week and all the additional stress and the, and the apprehension that staff have, is that gonna impact their, their experience when they're in school? Are we better off, and I'm not asking us to necessarily consider this right now, but I have to say it out loud, are we better off keeping things remote given everybody's concerns and, and kind of position right now? I don't know what other word to use in that. And I, and I have to say that out loud because it's been circling in my head and it's been amplified as I've been listening so far tonight. So I'm really anxious to hear um, the plan in detail that's coming up later in this meeting um, by phase level. But I'm, I'm going into it wondering to myself, what's the big pedagogical advantage to being back in the classroom given the, the pandemic and the situation and, and the evolving plan that we find ourselves in. And I think that plan is probably as detailed as it can be, given the fact that the reality of our situation changes hourly. Um, so I wanna make sure I, I wanna make sure I said that, but in my head I'm thinking, is all of this really that valuable educationally to put our students, our staff and our community through this type of transition? I, I just have to say that out loud. April? Uh, Dr. Fanberg, just out of curiosity, did you see a down tick in common colds or strep or things like that in the spring where you normally would have a lot of young patients with all of those what we're calling common illnesses because we have all been isolating? And with all of the precautions that we're going to take, so this is where I'm going with this, and if I don't articulate it well, I'll try again. Um, with all the precautions we are going to take, with all the hand hygiene and the masking and the social distancing, to me as a parent, I feel like if my any of my children had a symptom, I would take that probably more seriously than I would in another instance because I, I would think that maybe to some extent the kids won't be getting strep or common colds as frequently as maybe they have in past years? It's a great question. I don't have data to support. I can tell you, I, I monitor, I, I uh, involved with 22 pediatricians in my group. Um, we are not getting sick, okay? And it's probably because of the hygiene that we're doing now that we never did in the past. And it makes me wonder if I should have been wearing masks for the last 10 years that I've been seeing people. You know? <laughs> uh, I haven't gotten sick since February and knock on wood, hope it's not next week because of it. Um, and that would not be typical. And I can say my fellow pediatricians are not calling out for the same type of sickness. And I'll tell you, we are screened every day that we go to work that if we have any symptoms, we're asked to call in and make um, the, the statements along those lines. Um, th so that's a strong piece. Um, we do see some strep throat coming through. We're a little surprised by that, but it is coming through um, despite whatever's going on for isolation in our, uh, in our testing center. Uh, we are not seeing a lot of COVID, but there's some COVID in pediatrics. Uh, if it's very little, most of those kids have been symptomatic. The ones that we've tested have been positive. Um, and we're doing a lot of testing along those lines. Uh, I, one thing that you're alluding to, though, is if you can avoid any illness out there, this is the time to do it. And so if you have half decently treated asthma, 
uh, it's time to fully treat it, okay? So we don't find you in the nurse's office. So they're sent home for other things. If you have not got flu vaccine in previous year, even though it only worked 56% of the time last year, this is the year to get it because if it saves you 50 60% of the time, all the better. Okay, so another reason for not getting a fever. Um, and so all those hygiene things that go beyond just washing your hands, like getting vaccines, getting them up to date are really more important now than they were in the past. Any other questions? Sarah? Thank you. Can you speak to um, any knowledge you have as to what the testing um, turnaround time is gonna be, but I guess what it is now, and then what you would expect it to be in the fall when presumably, you know, districts are back in school and presumably there'll be maybe a higher rate of testing. It's just an assumption, but. Yeah. And so I know all the practices in the state are starting to ramp up with that recognition that testing will increase as well as assessments, as well as phone calls coming to physicians' offices. And that's why at the state level, we've been doing a lot of work with pediatrician offices and with healthcare systems. Uh, it's variable in our state at the moment. Uh, I know May Medical Center just opened a same day type test for testing, but uh, with turnaround time, they say in one to three days, we're getting back in 12 to 24 hours. Uh, I know that some of the sites in the state are also taking five to seven days if they're sending it out of state um, for the, the actual test results. So it's, it's variable and it's variable by which week and which center. And I wish there was one board where I could find this all, uh, but the expectation is we'll, we'll need to increase testing uh, to accommodate need uh, to get kids back to school. And I also expect that we're gonna have to have increased phone access for nurse triage type stuff to get people back to school and increased access for, to, for assessments and assessment centers for the same reason. Um, but we are figuring out how to manage that and we will manage it. Uh, and we have numbers to go by. I know my practice midwinter, we'll see about 250 kids um, a day and a hundred of those kids will have respiratory type issues. And we're looking at how to manage more than that um, for this winter, so. I have a very different question. Um, a lot of folks have been reaching out about getting ready to take college students onto campuses and in many of those instances, there are states that maybe are not considered in the safe zone for Maine. And the question that I've been asked is, how long are you in a state before you need to quarantine when you come back to Maine? So if it's, I'm not representing the state, but from what I read, I'm um, like everybody else is, uh, you're supposed to quarantine for 14, 14 days if you've been out of state or get a test within three days. Um, the, or get a test that's negative before you uh, unquarantine. And that's even if you're a state resident. Uh, uh, yes, you could question how valid is this test that you get just as you walk into the door to the state. Uh, but I also recognize it's better than no test. And it's how much risk are you taking? Are you going to Massachusetts or are you going to Alabama? Two different states completely. You know. So it doesn't matter how long you're in the state, you would still need to quarantine? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. This was incredibly valuable. I am so grateful that you came in. Um, and I'm just going to go on a limb and ask that if you'd be willing to come back again um, as we open and things are getting underway, I think it would be reassuring for us and for the community to hear from you. I throw out one last comment that is, um I think it's a feeling like we're going into the unknown worlds completely at this point. We aren't, okay? The unknown, back in February, okay? We know so much more now than we knew in February. Um, and having said that, there's a lot more to learn. And we will know more in six months than we do now. And uh, we just need to make it as safe as we can based on the best knowledge we have and go for it. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving back into the superintendent's report. Yes, so I'm pleased tonight that we are going to talk about the school plans for the start of school. And we have each building principal here. And I think we'll start at the elementary level. Might take a minute to pull them up.
Okay, let me know. I think I'm up first, so let me know when you're ready. We're ready. Okay, um, so first, um, I just want to thank you um, all for providing us this opportunity to present um, some of the very intense and around-the-clock work that we have been engaged in over the last weeks. Um, my colleagues and I, alongside many, many of our staff actually, have been deeply engaged in that START Committee um, recommendations for reopening our schools. Um, so since I get to kick this off, I'm going to take the liberty, if that's okay, of providing um, a public thank you um, to our staff for being such integral thinking partners um, in this process. There is just absolutely no way we could be where we are this evening without them. Um, you should know that there are actually a lot of teachers who are participating in the multiple opportunities that we're offering each week, and to be quite honest, um, they are bringing fresh eyes and fresh minds um, to all of the many puzzles that we're figuring out together. Uh, just yesterday, our lead teachers and our instructional coaches mm -hmm. met all day at each phase level um, to plan for opening. Um, today, a large group came together for K-12 curriculum work. Um, that was this morning. This afternoon, we had our K-12 SEL committees updating their plans. Um, and really, I could go on and on, um, but I guess the point um, is that there's a lot of stakeholders who continue to be partners um, in this reopening plan because we want to be back in school. Um, I also want to say that our families have been pretty amazing. Um, they are making some really hard decisions. Um, we're getting uh, so much support and a lot of thank yous. Um, so for that, we'd like to um, offer a thank you right back at you. Um, and one group that just doesn't always get public recognition are our building and our district secretaries. Um, so on behalf of every leader, and I hope that that's okay, um, I just want to make sure that they get the shout out that they deserve. Um, they are truly amazing um, and we just love them. So um, with that being said, and thank you for letting me um, take that minute, um, I will present our K-2 back to school transition plan. Um, so, Kelly, if you want to click on that first link. And I can't see everything on your screen, so just let me know if it is up. It's up, Jessica. Okay, thank you. Um, so, we... We really appreciate that the school board a couple of uh, weeks ago, um, feels like a lifetime ago now, um, listened to, uh, I'm so sorry, what's going to happen? It's not you, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> Bully sick right, hold on. Louie, come here. Um, my husband decided to go on a run, um, so here we are. This is real life, right? Okay, so um, our... School board approved um, the delay or a week um, late, a later delay um, for school to reopen, um, which we greatly appreciate because we definitely needed more time for that professional development piece for our staff. Um, but when that decision um, was made, we had not yet really like looked into the nitty gritty details of what that week might mean um, for our K-2 students. Um, so typically, as you know, we do screening appointments and we have families come into the building um, due to the physical distancing um, requirements that we have, that just wasn't going to be possible. Um, also with the AA, uh, the cohort A and the cohort B schedule, and then we have cohort C students, um, the way that that week was um, designed, it just wouldn't meet the needs of, um, of our students, our families, or our staff. So we spent some time really um, digging deep into what would meet the needs of our um, K-2 families and students and staff. Um, and we're going to present that to you here this evening. As you know, um, relationships with students and families are truly our greatest currency. Um, so we want to have a really great um, school year with them. And um, this global pandemic has disrupted um, everyone's life. So we want to take great care as we enter and re-enter school um, to not just do business as usual. There are new needs. Um, that our students and our families have and that our staff has. Um, so we want to commit some time um, to better understand our students and their families and um, where they are at as they come in. Um, we also want to make sure 
that our very first priority is that health and safety of our students. Um, so we have a reopening plan um, that we feel meets three goals. Um, we want to connect with our families. We want to support that social and emotional readiness um, for this new school experience. And we want to make sure that we are practicing those health and safety protocols that are gonna keep everybody safe. Our K-2 students don't necessarily have that muscle memory for school that our older students might have. So it's just gonna take a little bit more time um, to do that with them. So under goal number one and the connecting with families, um, we want to make sure uh, that we see our families face to face. Since we won't have screening appointments, we don't wanna miss that opportunity. Um, so we w are proposing that we have um, three days, September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, where we invite families to come to the building and do an outside meet and greet. Um, there would be 45 minutes. Each cohort would be broken up into two groups, and we feel that that would allow us to meet the physical distancing protocols um, and accommodate the group size. Uh, we would respectfully ask that no more than two adults attend. We know that sometimes there are um, multiple family members um, beyond parents that want to come, but in this situation, if we could just have two people come with each child, um, and again, every student um, ages five and up must wear a mask. Um, our playgrounds would be closed during this time. Um, knowing that our parents and students really want to see that physical space, we are also planning to create some welcome back to school videos. Um, and our teachers will be creating welcome to our classroom videos. And so we would be sending those out to families in lieu of them coming into the building um, because we know they really do want to see what is this actually going to look like. Um, during that transition, uh, actually I'll move on to that next section. Um, in the red. Um, so this goal, uh, this plan for September 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th um, illustrates what, um, what it would look like when, if our students um, were to come to our buildings that week. So we would have a typical drop-off window. Our schools start um, at 8.50. Um, our drop-off window window that week and moving forward would be 8.30 to 9 anyway. Um, our school hours that week would be 9 to 12. Um, we would have bus transportation and parent pickup from 12 to 12.30. Um, and then once students um, got home, we were imagining that they would have lunch um, or wherever they were, they would do their afternoon piece. And then we would practice a remote check-in um, and then from 2 to 3.15 that afternoon, our parents would have opportunities by appointment to have that one-on-one -on -one check in with their um, students, classroom teacher. So again, we would be dividing up our cohorts into two different groups. Um, so our teachers would have small groups of students um, each of those mornings. Our cohort C students would be doing um, the same thing. So um, cohort C teachers would have small groups of students that they would be meeting with. One of the things to, um, to understand is that in the morning, our students who attended, let's say co it's Tuesday, um, group one and cohort A, they would be getting their laptop that morning on their Chromebook, and they would have an opportunity to practice and to log on and have support, go through some of those technology pieces um, in the classroom and with the teacher before they um, had to actually use it. Um, the last piece um, is uh, just what we would be doing that day on those days. So we want to make sure that kids get lots of opportunities to practice before um, everyone is there. So famil uh, being familiar with all the technology pieces, the Chromebooks, Google Meet, Seesaw, um, all of that, how to log in, how to you know take care of your charger. Um, and I want to point out that about 75% of K2 families are going to be transporting their own child this year. So we need to practice that drop off and pick up routine um, and having a smaller group of parents come through in the morning and afternoon will allow us to work out those kinks um, so that the following week when everybody's doing it, um, it's um, smooth and efficient. And then lastly, just the health and mm -hmm. safety um, pieces, that physical distancing, hand washing, lots and lots and lots and lots of hand washing, um, our lunch and snack protocols, wearing masks, experiencing a mask break, um, you know, how do I access my materials? Where do my materials go? Where do my personal items go? All of that kind of stuff. Um, we, we really want to give our students an opportunity to have some practice 
um, in a small group setting before um, everybody is back. So um, that is our um, plan and uh, we can take questions now. We can go through um, the next parts of the slide. I'll stop here if anyone has questions on this section. And Hillary, I think your hand is up. Um, so just, just for clarity, um, I understand breaking the cohorts into two groups for your meet and greets, um, but can you speak to why you would be, so my, just why you would be doing that on the transition days, my understanding, and correct me, I may be wrong, but, but that first week of school, each child will be going to school for one half day. Is that correct? That's correct. So they would get a face to face for our cohort A and B students. They would getting a face. They would be getting a face to face experience um, for that um, half a day. But then in the afternoon, they would be getting the remote experience. And so, and their parents would be getting that um, one on one opportunity with a teacher in the afternoon. On the other days that they're not face to face, um, there will be offline activities provided. So I we don't want anyone to think that they're only going to get one day that week. Um, they're going to get one day or half day face to face, but the rest of the time there will be um, offline activities provided. So are you saying that that time will be one on one with a teacher? That's why you broke it up into two different groups? No, it'll actually be half of the cohort. So our class sizes um, at K2 um, for physical distancing, we have 10 ish students in every um, cohort. So 10 students on A, so it'd be about five kids that they were with, with a classroom teacher. Okay. I guess I'm just not understanding why, I mean, it's already half the class. Why are you breaking it up again? Yeah, um, I think we wanted to be able to do it in a small group and, um, um, you know, I don't have another better answer than that. We just wanted to try to work with, um, with, with a small group of students and also really to, to to have some of those connection pieces that the social and emotional pieces when you have a smaller group you can have some you know some additional conversations deeper conversations that kind of stuff so we were just trying to emphasize um, that part of our days as well if i could uh, jump in for just a second to help answer that question as well um, in the past, we've had individual appointments with families and students um, for 30 to 45 minutes. So every teacher has met individually with each student um, over the first two days of school, oriented them to the classroom, gotten to know them a little bit, done some activities. And this leads into the next part of the slide anyway. Um, and we're not able to do that this year for you know, safety and health reasons and um, keeping as few people in the building as possible. So what is an alternative to that is to have a small group of students for a longer period of time practicing what the new school is going to look like. And I think we feel like it's really important to do that in a small group so that teachers can really get to know as each group of students um, individually, not individually, but in a small group as opposed to 10 kids all at once we're all going to be nervous going back to work. We're all going to be anxious about being in a place that we haven't been in in a long time or for kindergartners have never been in. So it's really a, a, a very careful um, way to bring kids into school and have them practice what it's going to be like and see what it's going to be like for a shorter amount of time in a safe and inclusive and welcoming way and nurturing and supportive. They're little little people and we want to take good care of them um, and that being said as I said in the past we have done academic testing um, on those first few days of school to see where kids are after the summer we are not going to be focused on that um, in the week of August I mean September 8th through the 11th we will be practicing the new routines of school we will be um, um, practicing hand hygiene and mask wearing and where to take a break for a mask and how to do things differently. Academics will definitely come along at the end of September, but it will not be our first priority that first week of back to school. Uh, we will be doing our child find screenings that are required by state law 
as well in September, but they will come after kids get a chance to um, get settled in and, and practice. So um, Kelly, I think you can go back to the um, slide that, that is the um, presentation and not on this link anymore. Um, but the, that's our child find and academic screening is will be taking place a little bit later in September. Once Kelly is back on the presentation, we'll have you, um, Kelly, pull up the updated kindergarten information link that's on that slide. While we're waiting on the link, I think Nick has a quick question. I do. Great. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, and, and thank you for the clarification, Anne. I, I just wanted to ask one quick question, which is I'm looking at that grid, and I know you just shut the screen. You do not have to bring it back up. But as I'm looking at that grid for the 8th through the 11th, and I'm looking at cohort A and cohort B and being split in half, as you described, I guess I'm wondering, um, what is the specific advantage in that first week? Because each student will only go to school once, uh, as I'm re if I'm reading this right. Why not have it be for a full day so they can experience that one full day and understand the longevity of the whole day if it's only one day out of the week? I guess I'm wondering why we're doing 9 to noon instead of a full school day to orient them to their new routine. I think part of it is to, if you think about wearing a mask for a full day, I think part of them is easing them into that yeah. process, particularly for our youngest students. The other piece of it is that technology piece and being able to test that out. You know, having the teacher walk them through some steps and then they're going to go home and they're going to test that out, you know, have a have a little check in in the afternoon with students that will, you know, be optional, but, you know, to go home when it's fresh and log on and hey, it worked, <laughs> you know, I can see you um, with those five students versus all the technology issues that can come with 10 kids versus, you know, um, a larger group. So it's just kind of troubleshooting and setting teachers and students up for success as much as possible um, and trying to ease all of the anxieties that both teachers and students and families have about, you know, making the remote learning piece of this work well. Um, so there's that piece of it as well as, you know, learning all of the new routines, the safety protocols, making sure that those feel manageable. Um, I, I think it's just going slow to go faster. We're, I don't think we're going to be going fast, but I, I think it's an investment of time that's worth the effort. Um, the other thing I would add, Nick, is that, um, you know, we, when we have screening appointments, parents and teachers get to connect one-on-one. -on -one. And so um, they meet with the child and then they meet with the parent and they have that chance to, you know, get to know a family. And we don't want to miss that opportunity this year. And so if we have students go for part time and they go home and practice the technology and then teachers are able to schedule those appointments with families, then we're still going to be able to have that um, for, for our K-2 families. And they're, you know, just like every family in the district, they're super anxious about what this is, what this means, you know, you know, how's my kid going to do? And it's also kind of a unique opportunity for a teacher to tell a parent, hey, here's how they did this morning, um, and here's right. what they did. So it's, um, it's that, that part we just, we really feel is, is going to help build those relationships with our families, because as we learned last spring, our K-2 families and our teachers <laughs> are like this. Like, they, they are tight, and uh, we want to build that um, relationship from the get-go. Thanks. So Kelly, if you could click on that updated kindergarten information link, that's going to bring us to our virtual kindergarten classroom. Uh, this was shared in June with all of our incoming kindergarten families, 
And at that point, there were, there were many things that we didn't know about what school would look like in the fall. Uh, and a lot of what we shared was sort of pending more information about COVID-19. So what we've done is updated a lot of the information. Um, so I think a lot of the questions and a lot of the things that we're talking about tonight are actually um, linked in and answered uh, in some of these links. So if you click on the bus, there's a little piece about transportation. Um, that'll take you there. And there's a few slides. You know, we don't have to run through them all, but just um, some quick information for parents. There's a little piece about what lunch might look like. Um, a typical kindergarten day, information like that. So it's actually geared towards kindergarten parents, but it actually, there's some information that's great for all of our K-2 parents and we could easily replicate that um, as we look at welcoming all of our K-2 students back to school. So um, just wanted to highlight that, we'll be sending that uh, link out to all of our incoming K parents, but um, it's here as well for all of you. Uh, so drop off and pick up is obviously going to be very different uh, from the past. So our, we've worked closely with Sarah Redman and um, it, for each school site to have a slightly um, different bus uh, drop off and pick up as well as parent drop off and pick up. Uh, drop off is easy because we can have staff outside opening car doors and helping direct students into the building. Um, pick up will be a little trickier and we're still working on the best ways to make sure we're matching kids in cars in an efficient, fast way and not keeping everybody waiting while we, um, you know, figure out who's in which car and who they're picking up. So we're, we're working on the details to make that as easy and as seamless as possible, but it will be new for us, so that's, um, that's going to be a learning curve for us. But we will be um, having larger parent drop-off opportunities in areas designated in each building. Um, you know, and we do know that Wentworth and the three little schools get out at the same time. And as we have done for the past couple of years, we will continue to accommodate those parents that are picking up or dropping off at both places. And um, and you know, they will con their children will continue to have supervision until they are safely in the hands of an adult parent. And um, and that's the case as it was the case, and it still will be the case. So. Nobody will be waiting outside alone for a car to drive by. We will be making sure that everybody is, is safely um, into a car with the right parents. So um, those details are a little bit different at each building, but, um, but they are being worked out. Okay. Uh, in terms of specials, there's been a lot of questions about specials or our allied arts at K2. We will still be offering all of our PE, health, uh, art, music, library, learning commons. Uh, they're just going to look a little, little bit different in the schedule. Um, we really want to prioritize uh, our academic offerings, and that schedule looks really different when you have two cohorts of students and that, that Wednesday in the middle. So um, to be equitable, um, really K-5, we're looking at offering um, those allied arts uh, per trimester. So we're still working on what that's going to look like. So you, your kindergartner may have art and music um, or art and PE for the first trimester and then music and library during the second trimester. So uh, that's that's what we're trying to figure out, um, and that schedule will be all ready to go by the time that school starts. Okay, are there any um, questions about this slide before we move on? Hillary? Um, are the specials classes going to be offered on your in-person day? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our next slide is um, actually a K-5 um, 
uh, presentation. So what a lot of families have asked, what does remote learning look like? So uh, we just want to reiterate that most of our students are going to be experiencing remote learning at some point in their week. So either three days or five days. So our instructional planning really needs to prioritize this remote model. Um, teachers are receiving professional development around best practices during remote instruction um, when they return. A lot of teachers have already done um, some of this work, have been emailing us around the clock to say, like, what about this, what about that? So they're, you know, really excited about what this, um, what this can mean. There's a lot of opportunities here. So, um, so specifically for um, cohort C, which are, which are our families who have um, decided that they would like to be fully remote, there will be a designated cohort C teacher. Um, so someone just in charge um, of making sure that that, um, that uh, week and is planned and um, looked at just for them. There will also be predictable daily schedules um, and the opportunities each day uh, for all students will be connecting with their classmates. And so um, our K-5 students will have a morning meeting. Um, we have it planned somewhere between 9.10 to 9.40 or 9.15 to 9.45. Um, so that will be very predictable for families. Um, there will be office hours offered every single day. So our classroom teachers will be connecting with students who are remote that day, um, ask, being able to answer questions um, that they may have about their work. Um, we will have specials um, and will be coordinated and then support services. So even if you're a remote, um, I'm sorry, if, even if you're a cohort C student, you're still gonna get specials um, and obviously, you're still going to get um, the support services um, that are on each student's plan. So synchronous and asynchronous, these are two words that uh, we're using a lot these days. They're going to, and we're going to continue to use them. Um, and there's some misconceptions, I think, about what this means. Uh, synchronous instruction just means that the teacher and the students are in the same place at the same time, that the learning is going on at the same time. And that can be in person or that can be online, um, but it's happening live. Asynchron asynchronous means that um, it's more self-directed. If anyone who's taken an online course, all that content is, is there online for you and you can access it when it works for you. So most online teaching happens in an asynchronous fashion. So none of our um, C cohort students will be online live all day long. Um, not only would we want, not want them to have that much screen time, but it, that just wouldn't work for our K-5 students um, for a lot of reasons. So what we will be providing, as Jess um, has spoken to a couple of times tonight, are those key synchronous experiences like a morning meeting because we know that something like that is works really well for those social emotional connections um, and connecting with students where an in asynchronous um, learning can really work well for you know a math or reading instruction where you can view a previously recorded lesson and do some practice work um, another synchronous opportunity might be um, a, an online, a live session with the teacher to get some help. So like a midday check-in and then maybe an afternoon meeting with the whole class or a small group. So again, this is another piece that there's a framework in place. All of the work that's going to be done with teachers during the professional development time are really when this is going to come to life because we have not planned every detail of what this looks like by ourselves. Um, we have had conversations and um, certainly done some brainstorming with teachers, but our teachers are going to dig in and really flesh this out when they come back to work full time. And I know, speaking for myself, I am really looking forward to that. So that's, uh, that's my bullet. And the last thing on this slide is um, that all cohort C students, so any student whose family has chosen to do 100% remote online learning, will receive the same instructional materials that anybody who is in person in a hybrid will receive. So all students will have a Chromebook. If there's a math 
math workbook. They will receive that math workbook to take home and use with their teacher um, throughout the year. Writing journals, math manipulatives. So in the past, there's been a lot of things that have been a collective here, the yellow table gets this box of math manipulatives to share. Um, now, we're going to be more careful with that, and everybody will have their own, um, their own batch of those things, um, and so that it will also go home with cohort C students. Uh, and so we're working on, on how to distribute all of that effectively and efficiently. Um, and you may not get everything all at once, but you will definitely get everything that you need to be learning from home. I think we can go to the next slide now. And just as a reminder, this is because we are asking parents to commit to a full trimester of this, um, of this choice. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Crosby, and I hope my connection is OK. Can you hear me OK? Great. Uh, I'm the principal at Wentworth School, and um, the previous slide and this one are really a K-5 plan. Um, before I dive into the K-5 Wednesday rough schedule, I just wanted to um, take my appreciation to Jess for speaking on behalf of all of the school leaders and sh expressing our appreciation mm -hmm. for the incredible support that we've had from our teacher leaders, secretary, central office staff, as we've dug into this massive work. Um, and we're really eager to get all of our staff back to, like Kelly said, really put the flesh to this outlined plan. So um, thank you, Jess, for so perfect. You are the perfect spokesperson. Um, so for the Wednesday schedule, um, most students on Wednesdays will be fully remote. We will have some cohort D students um, attending school in person on Wednesday mornings to receive their um, specialized services. And those are all hand scheduled, customized schedules um, that are currently being worked out. But most students will be fully remote on Wednesdays. Um, and that's the day that our custodial staff is going to really do a big deep clean in the school and have um, just fewer bodies to work around in order to do that. Um, so our students will be accessing their learning from about nine to noon on Wednesdays. And on those days, we're going to focus on opportunities for whole class meetings. You know, having the whole gang together on a screen is a great opportunity too. Um, focusing on social and emotional learning. And then as time progresses and as we get into our regular academic schedule, Wednesdays are going to be a really great time for just kind of some catch up, remediation, support, enrichment, teachers pulling small groups of students via a Google Meets. So we see lots of really great opportunities for that, um, you know, half day Wednesday schedule. And then, as you know, um, we are so appreciative that the board approved for Wednesday afternoons to be professional development time. And I know at the K-5 level, um, we are looking to have that be um, grade level meetings and very um, grade level specific and teacher directed planning time so that they can truly um, really collaborate on this work and looking at their plans over the course of the week and um, supporting each other. So um, that's an, a brief overview of our Wednesday schedule. Um, and I think next, we're going to really dig into the 3-5 back to school transition plan. So um, is Mr. Stoner on here too? Yes, I am. Oh, great. There you are. OK, so um, the first week of school is going to look a little different at Wentworth School than it is from the three K-2 schools. Um, we're following our we plan to follow the schedule as it was um, most recently published. And so that has us with um, Tuesday, September 8th, welcoming all of our third grade students. So both cohorts, even though that's a Tuesday, and that's typically an A cohort day, we're expecting all of our third graders to come to school in person on Tuesday, September 8th. Um, we're creating uh, a schedule today. Actually, two teacher leaders worked almost the whole day on the detail of that third grade schedule so that we could maintain um, the social distancing, make sure that we create opportunities for our students to discover their new school in a safe and effective way. 
Um, so that has looked really different in the past, but there are some great opportunities for us to redesign and rethink how we can do our students um, justice and really create the best possible start to their new school at Wentworth. So that's Tuesday, September 8th. Um, on Wednesday, September 9th, most of our students will be remote that day, as I just mentioned and gone over that schedule. Um, some of our D students may be in person, and that day will again be focused on SEL and relationship building. In just a few minutes, Mr. Stoner is gonna talk about the, um, well, how are they going to do remote learning without their laptops? Well, we've got a plan for that too. So um, stay tuned for the laptop deployment and pickup. So that's what our Wednesday, September 9th will look like. And then Thursday and Friday, September 10th and 11th, um, those will be our B cohort in-person days. So we're really launching into our, the beginning of our pattern, our new pattern. So our students who are in cohort B um, will be in-person and our students who are in cohort A will be remote. And those two days are really going to be about learning to navigate both platforms together. You know, having some friends at home and some friends in class. Um, cohort A is going to be a combination of designated synchronous connection times, just like K2 talked about, you know, the whole class together for a um, morning meeting and check-in and going over the schedule and expectations for the day. And then some asynchronous offline SEL opportunities as well. Well, cohort B is in person and we're really, while our kids are in person, um, throughout the year, but especially in the beginning, we're really going to be working on maximizing like socialization opportunities, safe socialization opportunities, social and emotional learning, our new routines and procedures, and all of those um, really important how to do school pieces while they're in person with us together. Kel, if you could go to the next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. And so, um, Drop off and pick up, just like at the K-2 schools, is going to be different this year at Wentworth, but I feel really confident in our plan. The buses are going to use a separate access road. They're actually going to use the um, road that runs between the Wentworth playground and the community services garage um, and the play field. It goes all the way over to the road that leads to the middle school. So that will be the bus lane. And car riders are going to have two, maybe even three, different loops. Um, I've just got to get confirmation from Todd Jepson about the third idea. Um, but car riders will use at least the parent drop-off loop and the bus loop so that we can designate by grade, by alphabet. Um, you know, we do have a lot of students and with um, about three-fourths of our parents committing to drive. Um, it's going to be it's going to take some organization and certainly at first it will take some patience but I'm so confident that we're going to get it down to a science um, and have it be safe and efficient and effective um, so the grade levels will have a designated drop-off and pickup loop so that we can on the back end of our day have a safe and efficient um, pickup time as well for students so no more um, I think this will make Hillary particularly really happy. No more walking into the Wentworth cafeteria to sign out your child, because that was always the bane of her existence, I know. Um, but there is going to be a drive up, and we're going to figure out how to um, do that really safely and effectively. And again, um, we will collaborate with the K K2 schools to um, make sure that kiddos who get out at the same time but are in two separate, separate parts of town and have one parent picking up um, will take good care of them. Typically, if you're in your neighborhood area and you can scoop through and get your K2 kiddo first, um, the line has died down by the time you get to Wentworth and it all works out. So um, we've done that for the past couple of years and we'll continue to do that with our families. Um, do you want me to pause and if there are questions on the first two before we get into the um, laptop rollout plan? I think, yes, I know I have a couple of questions. Okay, sure. Um, specifically to cohort C. Uh -huh. So the students will have a dedicated teacher from what we've heard. Yes. At the end of the trimester, if a parent chooses to reintegrate into the classroom, how is that going to work? Because they're going to have new kids and new staff and 
I wonder if you could speak to that. Sure. Yep. So we thought really carefully about that plan. And so really we have our class list designated, right? And then there are one, two, or three from each classroom who have chosen cohort C for a variety of reasons specific to each family. So they're their own little classroom. And then at such a time after the first trimester or after the second trimester, um, a parent or family chooses to have their child reintegrate into in-person learning, they we think we can maintain that spot in their original classroom with their familiar peers from the previous year. So there will be a, um, there will be, of course, a support plan put in place, just like when um, any student changes classrooms, and sometimes that happens throughout the year. Um, so usually we involve our school counselors in that and doing a little, you know, setting up a little meet and greet for, um, you know, the new teacher and the student, a closure activity from the sending class. So we really thought that through and how to make that work well for um, students coming back to school. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Kristen? Yeah, I had a question about the first day, that first Wednesday, whereas the fourth and fifth grade students won't have met their teacher. Is that what that, you know, first thing 9 a.m. Wednesday morning will be, will be their introduction yeah. to their new, new teacher? Exactly, Kristen. And it's kind of strange, you know, obviously not ideal that you're meeting your teacher for the very first time um, via a Google Meets, but um, I have complete confidence in our teachers and in our staff for how, you know, how they will um, really optimize that opportunity. Um, our kids now have had our third, fourth, and fifth graders did experience Google Meets all spring last year, so it's a platform that they're familiar with, unlike the kindergartners and you know, I think for the K-2 school, it would feel pretty different. But our third, fourth, and fifth graders, um, I feel like developmentally they can handle it and they'll know when it's, you know, for A and B cohort kids, they'll know that my in-person day is coming up and um, and they'll have different opportunities then. But yes, the first meeting for fourth and fifth grade um, students will be just like this, virtual. Thank you. Hillary? Um, I was just wondering, uh, and maybe Sandy and Diane, this is a question for you. How many of our students have chosen fully remote learning? And um, are there enough students to, so I guess my question is, are there enough students to justify like one, te one cohort teacher, cohort C teacher per grade level, or is it one cohort C teacher for you know, first and second grade and one for third and fourth grade, or how did you just make those designations? Sure, I can, I can speak to that for Wentworth. Oh, yeah. you want me to expand? Well, I'll just give the big overview for the whole district first, because I think, you know, you're asking it for this level, but also probably yeah. thinking globally. So across the district, we have 11% of our students um, who have chosen um, to go fully remote for the fall. So uh, we will be welcoming back 89% of our students um, in person. Um, and again, those numbers look different according to different phase levels. And so, you know, you've heard what the, how the K to five is going to take a look at that. Um, the numbers look different at different phase levels. And so at each building, um, our leaders, and you'll see this through all the presentations, have had to take a different look at that, um, you know, depending on um, who those students were. Are the numbers higher in the lower grades? Or is it just? The numbers are the highest in the K to two level, yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. And so we watch those parent surveys come in every day and we're like, carefully tallying and collecting our data. And so at one point we thought we'd have one um, designated remote teacher for third, fourth, and fifth. And then we thought maybe we could do a, two teachers for three, four, and four, five. And now we are at the point at Wentworth, um, we have about 60 students and it's fallen out quite nicely with about 20 at third grade, about 20 at fourth grade, and about 20 at fifth grade who have chosen um, full remote. So that worked out great. 
Um, so we'll have one teacher per grade level. Any other questions about um, those first two slides before Brem talks a little bit about the technology deployment? Nick? Mine is really quick, and that is that you've referenced synchronous learning a few times, and I'm, I mean, we're in a synchronous online experience right now, and I'm wondering if, like these meetings, will they be recorded in the instance that a student can't be there in that moment? Will the synchronous opportunities be recorded for them? I'm going to actually kick that one to Diane because sure. we've um, had a lot of conversations at a district level around student privacy and those pieces. Right. So, um, I think that's a piece that we are still working out at the current time, and you know, working with our IT department and taking a look at the platform itself um, because there were some additions made to Google Meets um, over the summer that allow for more privacy, for example, like blurring your background so that you don't have to actually pick a, next, a different background um, and those types of things. So um, that is a piece that is uh, still uh, in the process. Yeah, no, and I completely, and to not be mysterious, the reason I ask is actually because of my experience in, in, in the professional arena in colleges, whenever you record students, it raises the hair on everybody's neck. And so it's, it's one of those things you have to be very careful with. And, and so I, I didn't mean to ask that question mysteriously, but that's why I was wondering, because I'm yeah. sure the parents have questions about the, that. The other piece that I would add, though, um, that would provide you with a little bit more information is if we think about the, the cameras that we have made significant financial investment in so that our teachers have <laughs> upgraded capability, um, those are going to be set up front facing to the teacher, not projecting to the rest of the students in the classroom. That's so, important. you know, yeah. from the classroom privacy piece, um, you know, that combined with how we can approach the platform itself of Google Meet, um, those really are going to work well. Yeah. Thank you. All right, now we're ready to move on. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Brem Stoner. I'm the assistant principal at Wentworth. And I want us to start by thanking our IT team. Uh, they have put in countless hours behind the scenes to uh, make sure that all of our devices um, throughout our town and our schools are ready to go this fall. Um, and also our coaches um, who have been such a valuable resource um, at all phase levels to really um, just be a great resource for our, our students and our staff because the platforms that we're using and, and had to learn to use in some cases relatively quickly um, in the spring, um, they are continuing to offer professional development and really grow that. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, and I want to just talk a little bit about their device pickup, uh, because I know that was a question. And some of this information may echo what we already heard from the K2 principals. Uh, but all Wentworth students will have a school issue device to access their remote learning. And uh, we are going to send some specific information to families real soon, um, as far as time frames and learning communities and all of that, because um, we do want to do that safely and, and have small groups. Um, okay that come to pick up. So you can see the dates right there. Um, for August 27th, we'll have our fourth grade students. August 28th, our fifth grade students. Um, we will have some grade three students, um, as Kelly Crosby mentioned, who are remote only. And so by appointment, we are gonna um, offer that day for um, any families who may have missed uh, the previous two dates, as well as for our grade three remote students to come and pick up their device. Our goal is to make sure that for those students who are returning to Wentworth or our cohort C, that when they log in on that September 9th, Wednesday, um, half day remote day, that they have their device and that they also know how to log in. So part of this uh, is going to uh, include a short login session if they uh, need that assistance. And my thanks to the Wentworth staff members who have already stepped forward. They're excited to see the kids and welcome them back and, um, and provide that support when they come to pick up their devices. And on the next slide, we could go to that, is just a little bit more about the Allied Arts at 3-5. Um, so in a typical year, our students access uh, one day per week art, music or band, PE, health and STEM, as well as pathways. 
and we want to continue and plan to continue to offer those in person uh, for our students who are in cohort A, B, or D, um, as well as um, the Pathways curriculum. And those include world language, developmental guidance, learning commons, DARE, um, puberty education. And so in the course of their three years, the Wentworth students will access all of those Pathways curriculum. So we had to think things through and do things a little bit differently as far as the schedule goes. Uh, we are going to um, make this a K-5 that they'll have two allied arts courses per trimester. Typically at Wentworth, they're 50 minutes long, but we're going to increase that to 60 minutes. And that helped us with making sure we had adequate transition times. We're really thinking carefully about the traffic flow of um, in a large school like ours, making sure that students are moving safely throughout the building. In some cases, the allied arts teachers may go to their space, but it really depends on the class. And in most cases, um, they'll go to the allied arts space. So one hour per day um, uh, when they're in school. And we are also going to develop a remote allied arts schedule for our cohort C students. So um, like Kelly Crosby mentioned, we have about 60 students. And it was great that we have 20 or so at each grade level. So that remote cohort C teacher will be able to work with two allied arts teachers for that trimester um, to plan um, the curriculum and, um, and align that within their cohort C schedule for the week. Are there any questions about either of those slides before I hand it over to middle school? I don't believe so. Great, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to present what our thinking is so far, and we're looking forward to get even more detailed as our staff returns. Good evening, this is Dave Currier, Assistant Principal at the Middle School. I would like to just start by reinforcing the comments that have been made by Jessica, Kelly, and Brem, that it has been such a team effort to get to this point where we can start to reveal uh, some of the plans that we've had, that we've been working on. And it's been, as I mentioned, a team effort with working with our staff, with uh, our custodians, transportation facilities, our IT department, and central office staff. It has been just a wonderful coordination of people working together. We realize that with our school and how that's set up, that we need to coordinate traffic patterns for students in the hallways and throughout the building. So we have a plan of designating left and right sections of hallways for students so that they could pass down through the hallways staying to the right and, and, core, and of course social distancing. Because of the traffic patterns in the hallway, if you've ever been in our hallways with students at their lockers, it's a great place for students to congregate and we have found that uh, there's very little passing room for students who are at lockers on both sides. So for the time being until at least November, we are going to uh, not allow students to use lockers, that's more touch surfaces that would need to be cleaned, more congregation, so students will be bringing their belongings with them for the day. And as I mentioned, we'll reassess this in November. As far as uh, our building throughout our building, I know there have been a lot of questions and we addressed this at our parent forum last evening, that uh, our, our air filtration system throughout the building and through the portables has been updated, has been serviced so that we are expecting uh, a, a very nice flow of air into the building from outside and then air is taken from inside the classroom and uh, brought back out to the outdoors. With our, uh, with our traffic patterns, we've also changed our, how our stairways are used. Normally on a stairway, we have students on one set of stairs staying to the right, while the other students coming down stay to the left. We are keeping one set of stairs for an upward direction and one set of stairs for a downward direction. Those will all be designated stairways and there'll be signage throughout the building for our traffic patterns. 
there have been questions about restrooms and the restrooms will be sanitized as often as possible, especially the areas that are high touch surfaces, not just in the bathrooms, but throughout the buildings, whether it's door handles or uh, crash bars to open doors, those will all be disinfected. And Todd Jepson, our facilities manager, has been uh, working with our maintenance staff to create schedules for timely cleaning throughout the day. Uh, as far as water breaks, we are encouraging staff members and students as well to bring water bottles to school so that they can use all of our new fill-up stations with water. And these are no-touch stations. If you have a water bottle, you can slide it underneath. The eye will uh, realize that there's a, a water bottle there and it will fill up. So there's no touch. We would ask students to start by filling water bottles from home. And also, as they're bringing their water bottles into school to designate, uh, put their names on those water bottles in their grade level. So when you picture the amount of left behind items that we have, we'll be able to get those back to students uh, very quickly with their names on them. Could we have the next slide, please? Also with changing not just student traffic patterns, but our traffic parent uh, drop-off patterns will change too. We've been working with facilities and also with our transportation department. Similar to the Wentworth drop-off plan, our buses will be going starting from the ice rink down the back emergency entrance way and will be dropping off in the space between the sixth grade portable and Wentworth school. Students will be off the buses, staff will meet them and direct them into the buildings with whichever grade level they are. We would ask, this is going to impact parents or staff members who generally park in that area. There are going to be areas of that parking lot that will be blocked off with barriers so that buses will have a free flow coming from the emergency access route to drop off and then back out uh, taking a right onto Quentin Drive. So they will not be in our former bus loop. That will be used for parent pickup and drop offs during the day. So with the parent drop offs, we have, as you all know, one way into the middle school and one way out. So it's going to, we're going to rely a lot on people's patience and understanding. We will have staff members every day. Officer Pellerin, our SRO, will be out directing traffic, as will I. We're out there every day in every weather, making sure that our students are safe. And we will have uh, staff members out there that will be designated to help with students in waiting areas as they are dropped off. So generally, we've had one drop off in the loop closest to the middle school, and then a parent drop off outside. Now that the buses will not be using that, parents will be directed towards the inside loop by the school or the outside parent drop-off, and all students will be crossed on the crosswalk, as they always have. When students come in and drop off, they're dropped off, they will be able to enter the building at 740. If parents, we've had many questions from parents asking, is there any way that they could drop off earlier? And we will have staff members out there for supervision starting at 720. And that will be a 20 minute supervision where they will be meeting with students. There'll be specific areas where students will be able to meet, all socially distanced, all with masks. And then they'll be allowed to come into the school at, at 740. One of the things that I would like to also mention, and it has been mentioned at some of the earlier grades, that we met with our staff, some of our staff members on our instructional team yesterday, and different grade levels are planning welcoming videos for students. So we think that this is a nice way to kick off the culture of the middle school, making it a welcoming school as it always is. And also staff members will make videos and will send these to students on some of the procedures that we're going to be using with walking in the hallways and, and reinforcing from a positive standpoint. Kelly, could we have the next slide please? And Kathy Terrell, our principal, will be working with the next two slides. Thank you, Dave. And I do want to thank Jessica for her opening statements. We would not be where we are today without all of the help of our staff. Um, teachers have been great about 
you know, I've asked them, can you do a quick check in with me so we can discuss things? And so it's been great. With our remote um, learning plan, that our students who are will be 100% um, remote learning, they will be grouped together in classes whenever we can with a dedicated remote teacher. So in sixth grade, we have um, approximately 30 students now, seventh grade 39, and eighth grade 21. They have been going up a little. So, um, some of our new students who are registering are choosing remote learning. So I could see the numbers um, go up a little bit more. So as you can see, that's a little bit more than a class. So there will be a class of remote learners and then we'll cluster um, the other students together. And so what the dedicated remote teacher means is that they would have their math teacher would be teaching them remote and then they would have a different teacher for social studies possibly science and their encore teachers will also be meeting with them remotely all of our students will follow a regular schedule while in person and on remote learning days Attendance will be taken at the start of the day during the morning crew and during each class period using PowerSchool. So students who are remote learning will log into a Google Meets at the beginning of each class. And so the teacher might have um, uh, some direct instruction. They might check in on the directions for the day. Students are not going to be on their laptops the entire day after this check-in. You know, depending on the unit and depending on the teacher's plans, they may then um, go offline and do the, their work. And so there will be this mixture of the synchronous and asynchronous method. So that work time would be built in, but if a student decides to do that work, you know, in the evening, that's fine. Um, but the goal is for students to be able to complete the majority of their work during the school day and not be on, you know, in their classes all day and then have, you know, homework, a lot of homework at the end of the day. We will still have all of our Encore classes. We are um, working on scheduling band and music on remote learning days. I met with our band and music teacher and they can give them a more rigorous program if they can be having the students play at home and then they're able to play and demonstrate. Um, one of the things we've done though is we, um, in a regular school year, students would, in our four day rotation, would have art two of those days and tech and engineering the other two days. We have, um, rescheduled the allied art so that a student would have art each of the four days for a quarter then the next quarter would change to the tech and engineering so that allows for one thing students don't have as many courses as they're trying to keep track of and it's reducing the number of teachers that a student sees and then I have had some questions. Will the curriculum be the same for both sets of students? And it will, they, it will be. They'll have the same standards and learning goals they're working towards. And teachers will continue to plan units together for both the in-person and the remote students. So if you could go to the next slide, Kelly. Just to talk about... Um, you know, our Wednesday schedule, um, most of the students are fully remote from 8 to 11. There are students in cohort D who may have in-person classes or support services scheduled on Wednesday instead of um, some of the RISE blocks. Depending on their, uh, the support they get, they may still be able to participate in a RISE block. Um, so students will check in with crew for a half an hour and the goal during one of the goals during that crew time will be to have teachers will help students to go on and look at their power school look at their courses 
see what work that they may need to work on for the day or which teachers they want to connect with. And then using our enriching um, students program where teachers can tag students and students can tag teachers, they'll sign up for their RISE blocks. And then for our last block, um, we're going to be designing some SEL opportunities. So an example would be on the seventh grade um, wing, the seventh grade teachers would talk about some of the activities they could plan for students. They might pair up and um, have a cahoots game opportunity or a chat about a certain subject and post the um, offerings and giving students a chance to talk with friends on their from their grade level on which um, activity they would like to sign up for. Our um, first day of school looks very similar to Wentworth's where we will have all of our sixth graders in cohort A and B. We'll also have our remote students We'll also have our remote students um, who will be in activities also. And so the sixth grade teachers have been planning this. We also have our device pickup on um, August 27th and 28th, similar to um, Wentworth School. And a um, communication will be coming out to parents tomorrow morning with our laptop and um, device pickup along with um, the recording of our middle school parent forum that occurred last night which has a lot more details than what we've shared today. you guys have questions? Oh, I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> um, one of the things that Dave had mentioned was with traffic and having folks directing um, right around the drop-offs. Are we going to have any support at 114? Because I know that that can be a huge lockup as people are trying to get into the loop to get back to the school as well as getting back out after they've done the drop-off at the middle school. Leanne, that's a good question, and that is something that we have taken into consideration. Uh, I have a scheduled meeting with Rob Pellerin to see how much our, our public service staff can help us out with that, especially in the first couple of weeks where everything is going to be so new. But yes, that, that has been discussed, and that's on the table for uh, a plan. Excellent. Um, and with that, especially in the first couple of weeks as people are trying to get used to the, the drop-off schedule, is there going to be any relief if people are late? Yeah. Um, okay. I just wanted to make sure we had a little leeway for staff and parents. Yes. Um, we, we talked about that in our leadership meeting with teachers at the middle school yesterday. And definitely. Yeah. I was going to say, um, being in the way back, you get the joy of there's only one way to get to you. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions, Hillary? Um, I have a couple, just a couple of quick questions. Um, some of the other schools mentioned the percentage of parents, like it was around 75% that were gonna be driving. I think you're on mute, Hill. I'm not. Can you hear me now? Yes. So um, the other grade levels mentioned about 75% of their parents had um, offered to do their own pickup and drop off. Is that the same for the middle school or what is that percentage? Yeah, the number that we have is, is pretty close to that, whether that's an actual or not. I think it's going to be dependent on with some people on work schedules and days that sometimes the bus would be a good option, but we want to prepare for up to 75% if it isn't that much then then we'll adjust as well okay and then um my other question was are you also planning on offering your specials only on the in-person days 
know, um, for instance, in our in a um, quarter, some students will have art for four of the days. So two of the days will be in person, and then two of the days will be remote. Okay. Um, and then my other question was, I, I, I was a little confused by what you were saying, Kathy, at the very beginning about um, the cohort C. Yeah. So you said that there are, can you explain that again? Yes, we have um, a little bit more than a class of remote learners. For, um, for at this, grade? Yes. Well, not in eighth grade. In eighth grade, I have one class. Okay. But in sixth and seventh, I have um, a few more than a class. So in, the, in their crew, which is their morning grouping, that stay together throughout the day, there'll be a few students who are remote over that number. So they will be clustered together. Okay. Do you get it? They'll stay together. So Hillary, like say 24, so in sixth grade, 24 students will be a remote classroom. Okay. That it has a remote, their teacher for crew is remote and they're together. The other five students will be placed in the same group, in a in a different crew, but together. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, if we could have twenty more students sign up for remote in sixth grade, I would have two remote sixth grade classes. Nick. So I, I just want to clarify really quick because I, I think I'm understanding this now. So my first question is ridiculous, and that is that crew is basically homeroom, right? Yes, it is, okay. Nick. And, and we're going back to what we call <laughs> divisions, where okay. they're go the students are going to stay together as a group um, for the day. Some okay. stu students will leave um, to go to P.E., They'll also leave a classroom to go to world language because in that um, homeroom or crew, as um, we call them, we have a mixture of Spanish and French students. Okay. And they will move for their mask breaks and for lunch. And so in the, in the example you just gave when you were answering Hillary's question, so if there's five students left over from each grade, will they be put together? So you kind of have like a, when I was in the middle school, we called it the gold program, which is really blasting back saying that. But um, will it be like a mixed grade group for the overflow or will they have individual grades? No, they'll be, they'll be in another class. Okay. They'll be in another um, homeroom. So that homeroom would have, um, well, depending on our numbers, um, could have 10 10 additional students that are just remote with a mixture of students live. Thank you. Or in person. Any other questions? I think that's good. Thank you so much. So I think we're ready to go to the high school. Thank you. Um, I want to echo the, the thank yous that everyone had. We certainly have had a very strong team at the high school this summer working. I would especially mention Sean Bushway, who helped create a master schedule for the very first time with me during COVID. That was quite exciting. <laughs> and um, I also would feel really remiss in all of this to not really thank the um, central office leadership team for the 
unbelievable hours and focus and um, the research they've done, getting us questions to answers. They have just been super supporting us this summer to make all of this actualized. So we've had a great team all around. We had a great meeting with our instructional leadership team yesterday at the high school to develop some plans coming into the year. It's been a, it's been a great um, collaborative effort. So, <clears throat> hallways and the building. So this is some of how we're gonna operate at the high school. So we're very fortunate that we have very wide hallways at the high school and so they're gonna look a lot like roadways um, for us. We are putting some center lines down the hallways and we're gonna be walking to the right like you'd be driving. <clears throat> we're um, putting slashes on the um, hallways about six feet or a little bit more apart so that as students are moving, they can judge that they're staying the proper distance in the halls while they move. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's um, something that Mr. Coombs and Mr. Yo have been working on the last few days. Um, we are going to keep to the five minute passing time. Mostly we're keeping that because we are afraid that if we have a whole lot more time than that, students will think congregating is a good idea. And so what we're planning is to keep the five minutes but just say to staff, we, we want students to move slowly and carefully and distanced bet between class periods. And if they're, if they're a little bit late getting there because they've been following the road rules, then that's gonna be okay. But we're not gonna um, have that time extended too much because we're afraid that would start congregating, which we're kind of avoiding. And much like we've heard at some of the other schools, for now we're not gonna have lockers um, in use, but we will be thinking about it more um, as it gets cold and jackets and gear starts being needed. And what we're thinking there is that we would maybe have them use lockers before 7.55 and then after the bell rings at 2.25, but during the day, they would still be locked. Staircases at the high school, um, we will have traffic patterns. We have a few staircases. If you think about the staircase as you come into the main lobby and you're headed toward the auditorium, that is an extremely wide staircase. So we will have one section going up and one section going down so that we can um, keep people socially distanced. Um, some of our narrower staircases are gonna be designated either an up or a down. Um, and we have one staircase down at the Alternative Education Gorham Road end of the school, which we don't, it's not the widest staircase. And um, we do need to have traffic going both directions down there. So we're going to just institute a check when you're at the top of the stairs coming down, you announce that. And if there's nobody there, you can head down. If someone says, wait, you'll just hang for a second until someone gets up so that we're only on the stairs one direction at any given moment. Cafeteria, we've planned some traffic patterns getting into the um, food service area. And again, that's gonna be sectioned off and marked at six feet. We will be um, having students eating in the cafeteria, in the main lobby, in the rear of the auditorium and the stage, um, dividing them up so we can be at the 50 um, students, at, at least for A lunch and C lunch, where, which are our bigger lunches. B is generally a little bit smaller and we might be able to stay in the cafeteria main lobby for that. Um, so we've got a plan for that. Cafeteria services is developing their own plans about um, food safe service options. That's coming out soon. I did speak to um, the director of food at the high school today and she said those, those um, that information is coming shortly. Um, we are planning and have worked with Todd. Some of our evening custodial crews at the high school will be brought in early to assist with um, a, a frequent rotation of sanitizing both the cafeteria areas and the restrooms. And um, their hours will be adjusted slightly to help with that. At the high school, we have an amazingly big building and typically one daytime custodian. So we've had to alter that plan to provide more cleaning. Student restrooms as well as staff restrooms will be um, sanitized as often as possible. 
Um, and any of the staff bathrooms, we will have some of the cleaning supplies and sanitation supplies available there if people feel more comfortable um, making sure it's been cleaned just before they use it or just after. We will have those supplies ready. Next slide. So our drop-off pickup, so add everything that K-8 said and student drivers. <laughs> so we've kind of reworked a lot of things um, thinking about this. Typically at the high school, most parents do a drop-off driving into that main parking lot, in with cars parking for the morning to loop around nearest to the entrance to the high school and go. There's a lot of traffic. Um, Sarah has said that for the fall, her plan is instead of using the bus loop for every bus to come through in the morning, she's going to be bringing the buses to the roadway headed to Wentworth, kind of toward the turf field near the senior parking lot, and they will be headed downhill, and she will release students to the sidewalk, and they will walk up the hill to the main entrance. The general bus loop will be used for our vocational buses in the morning. They will be parked there to pick up our voc students and get them moving on to their vocational sites. And then a new feature, we're, we've been working with um, Todd and Dan this week. Um, we are going to recommend for parent drop-off, instead of getting into the parking lot, um, to come down the hill here from Route 1 turn right after town and country so you're on that access road that really does go all the way to Gorham Road however usually it's gated at the end so parents don't use that as an option but we are going to have that gate open and we're going to ask step parents to come down take the access road straight and drop students off at door 15 or 14 and then they can move straight on to Gorham Road and go right or left to leave the building and we're hoping that will help some with our traffic. We always know at the high school we have less cars in the fall than we do in the spring because we have more students that aren't drivers yet as we start the year and those numbers rise. So we're hoping to get that worked out. We will have the cafeteria and main lobby areas open before 740 and um, students will be able to go and get morning breakfast or things and social distance we will have staff, we've already built a plan for staff inside and outside to help with that morning transition. At pickup time at the end of the day, we have worked on a plan where we're going to dismiss not by a bell at 225, but by announcements where we're gonna do some corridors at a time, which we're hoping will kind of cause a more even flow out of the building. We have the grace of a little extra time in um, at the end of the day because the buses begin at the middle school and then move up to us. So we'll have a little extra time there to dismiss um, by a couple of quarters at a time to keep our numbers down and um, socially distanced. And we've already thought that we may have to kind of rotate how we dismiss maybe by quarter so that the same teachers don't have um, students at the very end every t every time. So we'll we'll kind of rotate that through as well. And the next I think we have a little picture, if my memory serves me correctly, that kind of shows how this is gonna work. So the yellow is where Sarah will be dropping students off, heading down toward Wentworth. Parents can go straight and um, go straight out to Gorham Road and drop off at those two doors at that end of the building. And the bus loop itself, the regular bus loop, will um, be for the vocational buses. So I'm guessing that um, the parents that go to Wentworth or to the middle school by going down where the yellow box is, like cutting down by their turf field, that's probably not a good idea anymore? Probably won't be because that's where um, all of our busing will be stopping there. Um, but they can go out at Gorham Road and go back, go in down to Wentworth and then go back in. Yeah. So there, they may have to take that extra little loop. So that may increase traffic on on right. Gorham Road, right? For well, the for the we're people. trying new things, and yeah. we'll have to kind of feel it out a little bit. So, so I'm kind of wondering the same thing. So I'm I'm understanding you correctly. Your so parents would come in at like town hall, 
come mm -hmm. around and come back out on 114. Mm -hmm. And there's, there is or is not going to be, sorry, Alicia, I was dealing with the video okay. thing. There is or is not going to be um, any help on 114 for all the left-hand turns. Well, again, um, we've talked to Officer Plort about it, and he, I think, and Mr. Pellerin are working on okay. getting some help out on Gorham Road, at least to start until general traffic flow there in the morning is used to traffic coming out at that. Um, it is open already during the winter months. Once snow starts, that gate is open, and people know to use it when it's open. So it's not totally <laughs> unusual that people come out there, um, but it'll be unusual first thing in the fall when we typically have that gate closed. And, and also, I know that people will still be pulling into, um, see where it says buses? For in green, that's where typically parents come into that parking lot area mm -hmm. where everybody's driving in and out and go up there. And I'm sure there still will be some parents doing that, but we are going to try this to sell this other access to just keep things a little bit less clogged. I think people will use it because we don't, there's nowhere else to go normally. And if we're making a kind of a loop there, I think, I think people might use it. But do you, are you going to let kids be released from door 14 and 15 or whatever you said that was? You mean at the end of the day? At the end of the, yeah, at so the like. At the end of the day, our students can go out. And oh, they can, okay. Door they want. Okay. We aren't quite as formal as the younger levels who really need to keep, keep them. Our, our kids, when the bell rings, they're typically able to head the direction they need to head. So if they've got a job at Hannaford, they might go out the Gorham Road, Alt Ed um, door because that's the easiest road to head to Hannaford, so. Have you had a discussion about the potential increase in walkers given the increase in traffic flow and so people getting dropped off maybe at areas that might be unexpected and, and what that might look like for, for safety? We have not talked about that because in all my years there, we have very few walkers to school. Maybe um, some students that live just across Route 1, um, pretty nearby um, to walk, but we don't have many walkers. I, I guess I'm, I'm not explaining it okay. well. It, I mean more like um, a parent doesn't want to deal with the mess of, or, or a sibling or, you know, multiple siblings. And so kids are getting dropped off in different places on, on campus or around campus. Like at the Ohio parking lot. And they yes. Like, or, or like, you know, there's a, a Wentworth kid and the parents drop him off at the high school or, or a sibling is driving and dropping him off or something like that. I, I'm wondering if there's any, you know, you have people out there supervising. We are planning on um, having a crew of people assigned out in the parking lot. Um, Officer Plord talked about being um, right at the corner beneath town and country to be doing some directing. We're going to have someone stationed on both sides, um, on the bus side where the kids are dropped off and can walk up, also on the senior parking lot side to help encourage students, wait just a minute till the bus goes before you cross. I will probably be at the front door. Mr. Coombs will be down at door 16. We're, we're going to have an outside crew helping to manage. Okay, the, good. Thank uh, you. Even more than we have uh, other years. Thanks. Sue, could you check to make sure that that mic is on, please? I know those wireless mics have a way of, you know, the batteries not being yeah, reliable. It is. People are, yes, they're Would nodding, it so it is better it? now. It yes, better. But okay. I'll hold it here. Maybe that will Perfect. help. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, sure. I'm going to break into song in a minute. <laughs> okay. That would next be okay. Slide. <laughs> um, before oh, you hold move on, on the next can slide, I ask April had a question. I just, I just want to ask a quick clarifying question about access to the high school. The student drop-off, red box, door 15, 14, and 15, are those open in the morning for students to access, or do all of the kids have to funnel through the main office door? Um, before school, before the morning bell rings, those doors will be programmed to be open um, so that students can walk right in. But we will also have teachers stationed at those doors so that if there is a glitch in the unlocking, they'll be there to let them in. Okay. 
they'll lock back up again when, when school starts at 8 o'clock. They'll be programmed to lock down once the day begins. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to ask the same question about um, that I asked at the middle school. Will there be an opportunity for students to have a little bit of leeway um, with getting into the building um, as we try to get used to the new traffic patterns? Um, well, we typically are pretty black and white about the 8 o'clock bell. Um, we do make adjustments on bad weather days and things, and I'm sure that as the school year begins, as we're getting used to this, we will have a little flexibility with the start of the day. Thank you. You're welcome. So this schedule um, shows a little bit of the year of how we're going to work our days. Um, in general, if you go down to, I'm going to ask you to look at the week of September 14th, um, we'll have cohort A in person with a red two and a white two day. So they will come two days in a row. And then on Wednesday, we'll be remote. And you'll see that since it's a shortened day, we were, we're only going to do one of the days. So we'll have four 40-minute classes on those Wednesday mornings. And if you look week to week, one week it's white one, the next week it's red two, the next week it's white two, we'll go through to keep things very balanced um, in terms of students getting the same amount of class time for um, all the classes. Um, we also, um, you, you see the red one and the red two. That really is not important except for students it, use it to know when they have a lab when they have a double science class or when they don't. So as you can see, we've really carefully tried to um, make that very even. If you, oh, Nick? I was just gonna say that it actually, it actually makes it a lot easier to read if you put your finger over Wednesday, because then you can kind of see that between a, Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday, you have kind of a Groundhog Day thing going on. Right. Where you repeat those two days. Yeah, that makes total sense. It, we, it, at first it was hard, but now I can see it. We will. Um, be new learning every class though. So it won't be, even though um, Mondays and Tuesdays are cohort A for red two and white two, and Thursdays and Fridays are primarily cohort B, it still will be a new lesson every time they meet. So we, we will be moving forward. And that really is in response to a lot of student and parent surveys saying that to really try to lift the rigor and what we're covering in classes. Um, and so we're trying to work on that. If you look at um, Tuesday the 8th, you'll see that that's our freshman and new student orientation. We are going to have all of the freshmen come and we are going to divide them immediately into a cohort A group and a cohort B. And we're gonna kind of flip the day. So cohort A will start the day going through all eight of their periods in their schedule for a short time to find the location, meet the teachers. Then they will have lunch, and then in the afternoon, they will go outdoors and get pictures taken. They will, um, in a group of 10, do a tour of the building. They will um, meet in plumber gym to meet with Mr. Legage about activities and, and things like that. And then a, another group of 30 will be meeting in the auditorium to talk about um, the handbook and some of the organization of the building. So that is going to be our um, Tuesday, September 8th day. Um, and then the other thing that's just a little bit different on there is we're working for Thursday, September 10th to do some sort of a senior welcoming activity um, in the morning, probably from 7 to 7.40. Um, and we will invite both cohort A and cohort B, all of our seniors to that activity first thing in the morning. It will be outdoors, and we're still working on the details of that. Um, and then it'll end about 7.40 so that our seniors can get, we're thinking maybe Memorial Park, that they would be able to walk up and get to their classes, and our um, A cohort A students would be able to get back home and get ready for school to start. So we are still um, really trying to hold on to some of those 
wonderful traditions um, that I, we know our seniors have been missing and wanting. So we've been working on a plan to do that safely, carefully, but to have a little fun on that first day for them as well. So, and um, again, like the other levels, our cohort D students are students that may need to come more than the two days a week to um, fulfill their individualized plans and they will be scheduled to come in for those services um, additionally if they're needed. The last group I will talk about briefly in this schedule is our vocational students. We, um, that's the one group we are finalizing plans for. A um, Little bit of challenges. Um, each of the Vogue schools want only half of our students at a time. One of our Vogue schools has the same remote day as us and the other one has a different day. So we're going to be doing a little extra planning so that all of our students can get to their VOC program two days a week in school. Um, and uh, we've been working with the directors at the um, CTE schools and we are, um, we've finalized a plan we think will work. Now we just have to get down and figure out who's going where when. So that's next on our list. So we have considered them into the plan. Next slide. So for us, um, as you can imagine, um, our remote students will be a little, will operate a little bit differently than K-8 because our teachers are only certified within one subject area. So to pull a group together and have one teacher teach all of those um, remote students doesn't work the same way at the high school. So our remote students will be following the schedule that they asked for this spring and they'll just be always attending remotely. We will be planning on attendance at the start of each class period and at the start of the day. That's following the DOE guidelines. So our students will, whether at home or at school, will need to check in for their study hall period. We'll need to check in for their A East or academic enrichment support time. Um, they may just tell the teacher that they're there and what their plan is to work on if they're not in the building with us but um, they will be asked to be doing that. As I mentioned before, learning will be continuous. Each class period will be a new lesson. Um, numerical grades, this is, these are important parent questions and points right now. Numerical grades will be used again this fall and the GPA this semester will be calculated as usual and that is something we've had many questions on. Like you've heard this evening, just because Students are asked to come on online virtually when they're not in school. It really doesn't mean that they're going to have to sit all day in front of that screen and watch a class. Uh, we have a very talented, creative staff, and I'm sure there will be a beginning period to the class where attendance will be taken and maybe an overview of what's going to happen in class that day. And then there may have been some pre-work done that students that are remote would have some work to do on their own for a bit. So for example, our foreign language classes have an online subscription that they work on listening skills and um, lots of different tools they can use virtually. They may be asked to do some of that on their remote days because that's programming they could gain with listening and talking and do some of those things even, even from home. An English teacher might have a class going where they're working on some writing. And so again, they might have the class come together, talk about the assignment, and then they get some time to work independently. And the teacher might say to the remote students, I'm going to let everybody get started. I'm gonna take 15 minutes, move around the room, checking on them, and I'll be back at this computer at 10.15 to check with you and that's when you're going to be able to ask questions. So we see this even though classes will be synchronous, there will be asynchronous parts to the period. One of the blessings of the high school is we've got very independent learners. I think what we heard most in the spring was that there was so much asynchronous and it, it was just more challenging to get to that teacher maybe and get a question answered or get schedules synced. I think the fact that we're, they're gonna see their teachers every week and um, 
go over maybe work in person that maybe they'll do on those remote days, I think will help us move along a lot. And also to add to that concept, we decided to keep the 35 minute academic enrichment time in. So again, it's built into their day when they're on site to get to a teacher and make up a quiz if they needed to, or if they wanted a little extra help before a, um, an assessment, that they could do that. And since our remote students as well will be checking in at the beginning of AEAST, they could connect with the teacher and say, I'd like to talk with you online during this 35 minutes. Could you make time for me? So we're hoping that piece will really help our students get some extra support that they may be needing for those days when they're more remote. Next slide. I didn't, I didn't see any hands, so. <laughs> oh, I did have a question, Sue. So I'm okay. sorry. I was gonna wait till the end. Um, where the students, even the remote students, will be following the same schedules as those in the classroom, if somebody's not feeling well and they're home for any reason, instead of calling in sick, does that mean that those students can also log in and stay remote and follow the schedule? All of the students will know how to do that. So if they are not feeling great, but they're feeling well enough to be in class, we are certainly going to welcome them on the screen to get a little learning in. So yes. Excellent. You may okay, great. Thank you. They're quarantined, right? I mean. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if, if a student should be quarantined for a while, this should help them really um, stay more connected than they would have been last year. So um, for our remote learners, again, students will need to log in at the start of each class, and that does include their study hall in A East. And again, that is following DOE's guidelines. So um, I know I've had some parents say, do they really have to check in for study? And the answer is yes, because that's what we're being asked to do. Um, remote learners will follow their schedule and attend their classes remotely each day. And we have um, been developing a plan for material drop-off and pickup if we need it. We do imagine that a lot of our teachers will be able to um, master doing a lot of this work electronically, but we are wondering if there's an assessment or some pieces that they may need uh, a written copy. What we are thinking is that um, since teachers have the PD time on Wednesdays, Thursday morning by 10, we will ask them to get any materials that they might need to get to remote students to admin to. Um, we will be asking the secretary in that office to be shooting kids an email to say, you do have material this week. It will be down in the main office by noontime on Thursday. They will be able to pick it up from noon on Thursday through Friday, and that will be material for the next week. And for any students that we've been doing this all summer, any, anyone that doesn't feel comfortable coming into the building and our remote learners, that's a, a big possibility, they will just um, call the office and say they're there and we'll bring it out to the door. And um, so we, we, we're working on a material drop off and pick up as needed for students. They may have some weeks they don't need anything, but we thought we would have a plan for that. Um, I'm one of the parents who doesn't think they should have to, to log in for a study hall, but I didn't realize that it was a DOE guideline. Um, so my question is, um, shoot. <laughs> I can't remember what my question is. I'll remember in a minute, so. It was from the last slide. <laughs> yes. How do you plan to implement like mask breaks and outdoor learning at the high school? So we are thinking at lunchtime, um, if we can put a person outside once you finish eating, if you'd like to walk outside and social distance and have a mask break. Um, teachers will talk about what might work in their class, certainly in the fall. Um, sometimes teachers will do something outside for a bit and Maybe if, if it was a plan that they could spread out, we could do things that way. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly um, at lunchtime, 
while you're eating, that'll be a mass break. And yeah. really what we're talking about is really asking students while you're eating your lunch, not too much talking, um, and maybe go outside for a little bit after that if we can put a station someone outdoors. And also, like, how do you plan to discipline students who, like, refuse to wear masks? Because that's inevitable. Like, people are going to do that. So that will be a disciplinary issue. And um, if someone is a repeat offender of not being able to manage that, they will become a remote learner. Oh, I wasn't going to do it, but, you know. I you I'm not going to do <laughs> it. No, I'm a real follower at heart. So. I remembered, Sue. So. Um, I know, um, I know that typically the high school kids are used to having their schedules by now. Do you have a, um, a date when you think that those might be coming out? And That's also, will that have their final cohort information on it? Um, yes, we, so two things. We are printing schedules and stuffing envelopes tomorrow. Oh, okay. And, um, the plan is that they get to the postal office tomorrow and then I'm not sure exactly when they will be delivered but tomorrow's the plan for that and um, anybody except for CTE students that's the last group we have to work on anyone that is in a cohort other than what normally would have been the alpha slice got an email with a okay. final confirmation today okay. so we're just assuming that most people will know what their cohort is and if they didn't ask for anything special than that they are in their cohort. And we have reached out to those that asked for something different, just to confirm that they know. Thank you. Thank you. April, did you want to ask the question? I noticed your hand was up. Well, I, I'm, we're learning too, this asynchronous, synchronous um, meeting, I realized that I have some general questions and I should have asked the question each time the building principals, we had them in front of us because now I realize they've been devo demoted from the meeting. Um, and so my general questions are going to be trickier now. But my question to Sue was what in general, um, were we able to make the cohort accommodations? And then that's like one of my general questions that I would like to know kind of across the board too. So in general, absolutely, people that requested by the deadline have gotten their requests. Um, we did have more people asking about cohort A than cohort B, but since we have a group of remote learners that won't be there at all now, um, we felt it was closely enough balanced that we could make the change. Um, so pretty much anyone that asked by um, August 12th, has, that's been granted. We were able to do that. Um, one of the challenges for us, April, is that, as you can imagine, every class, the cohort A has sub-cohorts eight different times, depending on who's signed up for what class and how the alpha slice is in that class, that period. I do know that some teachers have reached out to our um, guidance counselors about tweaking a particular class where it wasn't such an even slice and they have as they've been able to um, they have looked at that and if there was an easy switch to balance it a little bit more they've tried to do that and just to follow up april in um, that question in relationship to other grade spans um, we have been able to accommodate people for their cohorts so you know Great thanks to our school leaders for being so flexible in um, really digging in and looking through each and every one of those responses to make sure that we were, um, you know, trying to work with our families as much as possible. Great. Thank you, Diane. Is that my last slide? I don't know. I don't know either. Oh, this just tells you a little bit about, since we're doing it a little bit differently on Wednesdays, we will only do one of the two days. Um, so red block, just a red day, and each class will be 40 minutes. 
We'll do five minutes in between the first and second block, a little bit more of a break in the middle, five minutes at the end, and um, direct instruction for that day, although remote, will end at 11 o'clock, and our staff will have the remainder of their um, scheduled day to do professional development time. Um, we are beginning the year with staff days on August 25, 26, 31, and September 1, 2, 3. Um, the 31st will be designated as a teacher design day. Administration, we will not be planning anything for activities that day. They can do what they need to do then. And um, as I mentioned before, our freshmen and new students will have their orientation on September 8th. Thank you. Again and see if that's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. It is. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sue, very much. And I'm also going to thank Peter Esposito um, for his willingness to jump in and give an update on nutrition. Peter, if you want to take yourself off mute, please. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, what we've done is we've um, we've purchased some extra um, warming units and carts. Um, we've also purchased a um, online ordering system, which uh, ties to our menu planning software, which will allow students to remotely order their lunch um, and. So they'll be contactless with the cashiers and so forth. Um, in the elementary schools, I know that they all all the menus, all the uh, meals will be delivered to classrooms. Um, we haven't quite worked out exactly how that's going to work out, but um, we're ready to roll with that. We've also purchased um, actually back in March. Um, all the covered utensils and all the plastic ware that we're going to need to uh, move forward with uh, having all of our items prepackaged and um, not have anything um, out in the open as far as salad bars, sandwich bars, anything like that. Um, so um, we've got uh, plans also for the remote students. Um, they also are going to be able to order online and um, on the days, um, if Wednesday's the day, I'm going to utilize my staff to help expedite delivery of um, any meals, and we're going to do that in a bulk, um, a bulk. Way. So we'll send out um, if students are in school for two days, we'll send home three meals um, for the remainder of the week. So um, that's our plan moving forward, and uh, depending on which model we go with, um, we're ready for each. Thank you very much. April? Uh, Peter, just a quick question. Are those, is the option to order lunch um, related to need-based if the students are fully remote or if families who have no. chosen fully remote would like to order five lunches, they can access that service? Absolutely. It'll be for everyone. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I cannot see the room, so if anyone else has questions, feel free to pop in and ask. I do, Lan. I, th I think this is a question for S maybe Sandy or Dan, but our, the first iteration of the plan that we saw, teachers were not remote. They were going to be in person on Wednesdays. Is that, has that changed, and are they now fully remote on Wednesdays? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Are, teacher, are teachers now fully remote on Wednesdays as well as students? So again, what it is is they're in person on remote on Wednesday in the morning. And then the afternoon is staff development time. Wait, so they're... I thought teachers were able to be remote if they didn't have students in the building. That's right. That's right. If folks can turn on their microphones, we can't hear you. Yep. Yes, Sandy. You... So originally, originally the Wednesday teachers were going to be on site, right. but we've changed that. 
Okay, right. So, so now everyone's remote Wednesday. Right. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. Yep. That's wrong. No. No. Only if you. Uh, yeah, if I could add a little cohort bit more D. clarification. Cohort D, if we have students on site, um, we will um, have teachers on site ser providing services to those students. So um, the Wednesdays, my understanding is that teachers will have a choice um, as to whether or not they want to use that day um, and operate remotely. Um, or if they do want to be in school, they can be at school. Um, given when we did our last uh, survey of staff, when we did the survey back in June, only 38% of staff said they didn't have any barriers to working remotely from home. So we certainly want to offer our um, facilities and make those available to staff on Wednesday should staff feel they need to be there. Um, and some staff will need to be there as a result of the students who will be receiving services on site. That's correct. Thanks, Thank Monique. You. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? All right. Like questions about the whole thing? The whole thing? Well, yes, um, before we moved into um, the next sections. So, yes, questions about everything. Nick. Actually, I'll go. I'll go after Hillary because I have more of a statement than a question. Okay, Hillary. Um, I just, I just wanted to say thank you to all of the um, hard work that's been obviously happening because um, we, we have so many more details than we did when we uh, when we just had the framework. And I know that um, I'm sure there will be just as many more details. Um, and and I fully understand, as I'm sure everybody who's been working on these does that this is something that's going to have to be lived to a certain extent um, to be able to just see how, how it works. And everybody's going to need to have some flexibility there. Um, but I think, um, like I said, I'm, I'm pleased to see all the additional details that have been added. Um, I do have some remaining concerns, especially it's at the middle school level, um, where students are going to be asked to sign in and be synchronous basically all day long. Um, some of those kids are 10 years old in sixth grade. Um, and I, I think that that is too much to ask. Um, I know that a, a big portion um, of this was in response to people saying they wanted additional synchronous learning, but you know, we, we also have to remember that this hybrid model with two days of in-person learning is like 350% more synchronous learning than we had in fully remote. So I just want us to be careful about that. And, and at the high school too, to a certain extent, I know that they have probably a higher um, tolerance. Um, but you know, those classes sometimes are 75 minutes long, right? 75 minutes long. Yeah. Um, and that's just a long time. So I just I just want to make sure that, and I'm sure you are, being very careful about um, what that's going to look like for those kids who are just literally sitting at home on the on their computers. Um, and it sounds like the K five are are um, a little bit different in that sense because they're not actually logging onto classes per se. Um, so I I'm, I don't mean to pick on the middle school or the high school, but that's just the um, the the way the schedule works um, is a little bit concerning. That's it. Okay. Next. Um, so I just I also wanted to issue a quick statement of thanks, but I, I also wanted to say that you know over the course of the summer and working with primarily with with Sandy and and um, and Diane through different things and different board activities, they've told us many times about the type of work and the volume of work that was happening to bring all of this together. Um, but the proof's in the pudding, and this presentation from, and I made a little list here because I don't want to miss big things, from curricula to lockers, buses, forums, mailings, schedules, traffic, technology, food, the list just goes on and on and on with all this work. And, and I think it would be impossible to leave tonight without some concerns because there's just no way to build a practice or a policy for a situation that is not only brand new, but is ever changing. And so the purpose of our Wednesday professional development has never been more clear to me because that time with all of our staff back together working um, to kind of adjust this and tweak things that turn out not to work is going to be absolutely invaluable. 
Uh, and all of our, our leaders tonight thanked the people that have worked with them, the teachers that have given their time, uh, and educators that have given their time over the summer to help kind of flesh out this plan. So I, I just want to thank all of those people and, and answer my own question that I started with. I started tonight by saying I was wondering if all of this was worth it. And I can answer that now and say, yes, it is. Um, because this, the amount of planning that's gone in to bring it to this point uh, is nothing short of Herculean. Um, but I also want to just kind of say something that's also in my mind that is not unique to this, but is kind of showing up in a lot of my board work, and, and I think some of the board work of, of the folks that work with me. And I'm going to quote a town councilor, and I can't believe I'm actually going to do this, but he said, both of these things can't be true. And I don't remember what it was about, but it was in a board meeting a couple weeks ago. And as I hear this, and I think about where we started tonight's meeting with our public comment, and I have wrote down some of the things that were said here about uh, our staff being anxious, overwhelmed, angry, feeling unheard, that reopening our schools was irresponsible. Those were things that were said in public comment. And both of these things can't be true because if we've, and I believe everything that was said tonight, that we have teachers that have been working tirelessly to help flesh this out. And of course, not everybody has because that would be impossible to manage. That's why you have educational leaders. But as a board member, it troubles me that we keep coming back to this, this climate of these two very discordant perspectives on the exact same effort. And so I leave a little bit concern, concerned about that, but I leave also relieved having seen this presentation and the amount of work that's gone into it, knowing that our students are in good hands. So thank you. Thank you. April? So I would like to echo a lot of what Nick said. Um, I thought that this presentation was beyond comprehensive tonight. I'm so appreciative um, as a decision maker for all of these details. And anecdotal, anecdotally, I'm very grateful as a mom who has three children um, at the K-5 level to have all of these details. And I'm sure that I will not be the only person to leave here tonight feeling that um, sense of relief that so many of these questions. So I thank everyone for taking the time to put this presentation together and to give us more details. Uh, I, I am sensitive to the comments that were made at public comment and I do feel um, that sense of concern that we seem to um, have two very different messages um, coming in our direction um, and so is not to dismiss um, the voices that we heard at public comment in any way. Um, I. I would like to see us continue to follow up with our teachers. Um, I think that that is our responsibility as a board to make sure that we um, are serving our students first, um, but we all know that a huge part of serving our students is making sure that um, our staff is also happy and taken care of. And so I have no doubt that as the plan continues to be unrolled, that staff that have concerns um, will hopefully also have taken um, some comfort from tonight's presentation. Um, but obviously, you know, we, we, we can't um, completely um, ignore um, some of these competing voices. And so um, we just need to go forward having, you know, um, heard them and then also making sure that we, we circle back and, and make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so thank you guys so much for this. Alicia? Thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, it's been really clear that there's a lot of anxiety in the community, in our students and the parents and hearing from the teachers. Um, I, I'm hopeful that this detailed plan will help with some of that anxiety that Many of the details have been thought through and, and will reassure people that um, I'm so pleased to see how rigorous the this um, course of study is going to be for our students and, and that we're, um, I just think that we're so far ahead of other districts, what I've heard um, presented. And I'm just really grateful that we're not throwing this year away for our kids and that um, there are accommodations made for those that are not comfortable to come to school, but it's still going, we're not going to lose their, their educational opportunities. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. And I think that people, no matter where they stand on any of these issues, should be grateful that 
to know that the, our kids are going to get their education this year. I mean, I think that that's really clear. And so thank you for all of the efforts you've made to ensure that that happens. It's, it's such a relief. Um, moving into the chair's report, it's going to echo a lot of what has been said just now. Um, I really just want to point out, it's hard to believe it's only been 70 calendar days since school let out. Um, the details, the plans, the work that has gone into getting us to this point tonight is incredible. And I cannot thank everybody enough for what you've done. Going back 70 calendar days and you have basically thrown away decades old reentry plans and rebuilt it from the ground up. It is unbelievable. Um, the care with the social distancing, how the classrooms are gonna look, how the stairways are gonna operate, how are parents gonna drop off their children in the morning, um, the masking, the busing. It's unbelievable what has been done, as well as to make sure that we're accommodating both in-person and remote learning for our students. As everyone has said, it is our students why we're here and why we're advocating for them. And you have really just, you've done this in ACEs. Um, I do recognize our unanswered questions. Um, there may still be open issues. And I'm just asking that we grant leeway to the staff as they work through these. Um, you have really met every challenge that has been, been put in front of you. You've worked hard to keep us updated as well as the community updated. And I really think that you truly have exceeded all those expectations with a thoughtfulness tonight. Um, this is just amazing. Um, the other thing I want to address is, again, with granting some leeway and grace. Um, it has not been a very graceful meeting tonight in some instances. We are trying to get used to a new setup, um, working through how we're doing this. We got really good at the remote part, and now we're hybriding, and it's different. Um, if you look at the screen, even the setup requires that not all of us can be in a room. We don't have the spacing, and this really showcases what the classrooms are going to be like and why hybrid is necessary for our students. Um, we can't all get at the table anymore, and so it's going to be different, and you're going to see different people in different places at different times. Um, but everyone is working towards staying safe and getting us back to being together and in person again. That is our goal. We can't give you dates on it. I wish I had the crystal ball to say that, you know, the COVID pandemic is going to end on X date and we are all going to be back together, but we don't know and we're doing the very best we can to ensure everybody is safe. So I really just want to thank everyone for their accommodations and the hard work to get us here tonight. Thank you. Uh, moving into committee reports. All right. So um, can you hear me? I'm, oh, yeah, I, I can hear me, so you can right. hear me. Um, so long-range facilities planning. We did have a meeting on the 7th of this month. It had been a while since we'd met. Um, obviously, long-range planning when the, the sands are shifting in the way they are in the, in the age of COVID is sometimes difficult to think about. But I did feel that it was important we met at least once over the summer. I believe we actually may have been a little bit earlier, but it's just, it's just been a while. And so I wanted to recap some of the conversations that we had, particularly the last one, because I think for the full board, this is a question that the committee has for all of you. Um, and so, but I'll start at the top with our portable projects at the K-2 schools. Um, we have two portable projects that are nearing completion right now, one at Eight Corners, one at Pleasant Hill. Both include two additional classrooms. You may recall that Eight Corners had two classrooms put on last year. We built that pad with the ability to expand, and we are doing that. Um, Pleasant Hill is about three weeks behind at the time of this update. They may have caught up by now, but both projects were still on course to, for September occupancy. So I wanted to share that with everyone. We also had a conversation about the use of those buildings. I think it was, I think I actually asked the question, which is, you know, with everything that's going on with COVID and the changing of our classroom sizes and, and, and all of that, well, does that change the use of these buildings? And the answer quite simply was no. Um, the space is still needed and we need to sp spread out more. So actually, thank God we have it. Um, then we started talking about the new primary school project. Um, you know, the budget process, which was, uh, grueling this year, for lack of a better term, and COVID-19 pulled us off course a little bit, I think, about having that particular conversation. But the, but the thing that we really, or kept that, I said that project going, but the thing that we really talked about at the Long Range Planning Committee 
was about the use of that $100,000 that is in our planning budget line. Um, we've talked as a board about banking it, about saving it up and looking to use it in full down the road. Um, but we also talked in our meeting about maybe a preliminary action, something we could use that money for this year to get the project rolling, because politically that might be more appetizing than sitting on 100K for a year. It was just some conversation that we had as a group. And then we kind of ended up talking a little bit about the status of the building steering committee. I wasn't, I, I wasn't exactly sure if that committee was still a thing, if they had met, if the conversations had stalled a little bit. And so we, we kind of were just wondering about that as a, as a group and probably somebody at this table can maybe help us understand where that committee is a little bit. And then at the end, we talked about long range planning itself. I, I've worked in planning for a long time and I also understand that people have competing priorities. And the last thing I want anyone to do is to come in to meet in a committee because you have a committee and you feel like you should meet. And so we talked about you know, the role of the committee maybe in prioritizing some of the projects that are still on tap, like the SHS STEM lab build out, and some things that weren't necessarily funded this year, but things that we feel like we still need to prioritize. The subject of Scarborough Middle School, of course, came up because the situation is unchanged. The sixth grade is still in aging portables. And, um, and the status of that building and the need for some, some significant updates are still there. And then I pose the question of, you know, let's ask the board. What, what does the board want from the long range planning committee? Because there's so many things we could do, but I also understand the, the purpose and need to be very focused on the present because it's evolving and changing right now and that's where our energy needs to be. And so I just wanted to ask the board, and we can have that discussion now, or we can have it at a future time, or maybe just to plant the seed for you all to think about it. What do you think would be the best and most uh, valuable use of the committee's time? So I'll take questions about any of that. But that was our meeting. Kristen? Are we answering the next question now? You can if you want. I think so. <laughs> I, I think just keeping an eye on, like you said, the middle school has some upcoming problems, but I think if you guys just keep an eye on enrollment, stay in touch with Todd and mm -hmm. at this point, not let any surprises sneak up on us. That's all. Great. I, I, I would, I would like to, um, sort of determine what our next steps are with with the um, new primary school and whether that includes the middle school uh, solution or not. And I think that the way we left it was that that was gonna be a discussion with the town. And, you know, of course, then everything is has been upended. But I do think we need to figure out who's responsible for that conversation and how we are going to sort of bring the town into that discussion as it seems like they are, um, they're really driving the, the, the course of when that's gonna occur as, as part of their long range planning. And so how do we, how do we motivate them to, to act and, and who on our board serves as that um, inter, intermediary? Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be at this meeting. I, I think the long range planning committee does still need to exist. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with a, I, like what I maybe see as a, as a next step for us is to figure out specifically related to the 100,000, like what are the options? Okay. Maybe reconvene the BSC, the building steering committee and ask if there's anything we can do with that. Um, and if not, then, you know, we present our options to the board with a recommendation from the long range planning committee. But I also agree with Alicia. I think it's important that we get with town council. And I think the idea was that there would be sort of a, a collaborative subcommittee that would just do general long range, like building planning for right. the town. Um, and so if that's the case, I don't see why that's not, that's something we couldn't get started in the next couple of months. And I, and I did talk yeah. to the building steering committee chair um, about the use of that hundred thousand dollars when we were in the budgeting process. Um, he did think that that was a beneficial thing for us to have that money, but he wasn't necessarily convinced that using it um, 
sort of for a partial project would be beneficial, especially given the status of the town's feedback that we've gotten. And so I think it might make sense to sort of further some of those discussions with the town to see if in the broader scope, if, if that money would, would be beneficial. Well, yeah, and one of the things we talked about in the committee was about with regard to the hundred thousand dollars, and people were just kind of throwing to see what would stick against the wall. And we were thinking about things like a traffic study, or are there sites that we should be investigating to see, you know, what would it be to put a school on this site, and how would that affect the area around that site? I mean, those are kind of almost ancillary projects that if we did them now, then a couple of years down the road, or whatever amount of time down the road when we actually break ground, it's not information that would necessarily expire. It's information that we would still be able to use. And so that was really important when we thought about hypothetically using that money. We don't want to use it just to use it. We want to make sure that if we use it on something, that it's got a shelf life long enough to live the length of the project. That was his concern, is that yeah. that would be stale um, right. data at that point. That was the feedback I got. I, I talked to him and a couple other members, and it was the same thing that they didn't that a hundred thousand dollars isn't enough, uh -huh. um, and that and that what you could do with it may not stand the test of time by the time we actually get. And and their concern was that it would then be wasted. Um, also, uh, there was another. I, I mean, Alicia and I can certainly go back um, to them and and ask um, again for like a, a, um, a an official recommendation on that. And like, like we said, we had both just talked and it's kind of anecdotal, but um, the other thing was um, that the two members of the building steering committee, not me or Alicia, um, met with, I know Tom Hall, the town manager, and maybe the town Paul, planner, I Paul, I don't know. Um, and they had talked about um, working together to fund some of the larger projects in town. Um, and and if you, I mean, if you if you want, I can get in contact with them and find out where that is. Be um, because the my understanding was that they were going to come back after the budget, and I haven't heard that they've done that. Um, and, and you're right, we need to talk to town council. I mean, we have town councilors saying, I'm not very happy with the board for springing this on, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> like things like that. And so we need to, you know, I guess, um, create a narrative that makes more sense to them um, and that this is, this is a need that we have um, so that they can get on board and we can continue to move forward together. Um, but yeah, I can do that if you want as a deliverable. I can get back to you on that. Perfect. That's what I got. April? Oh. So I don't have a slide for my liaison update, but I was going to talk to you guys a little bit about what town council has been up to today, actually. Um, they met, and this dovetails with the conversation we're having. So they met today um, as an ordinance committee to review a report that an intern put together for them um, to look at growth. And um, they're getting ready to kind of talk, I think, as a council about the growth ordinance and, um, you know, the number of building permits and all those kinds of things that they issue. And so, I think if past dictates anything, we've learned that we would like to have a seat at the table at these conversations. Um, today at their ordinance meeting, it was really just a preliminary um, discussion. And I tried to access the report during the meeting, but I couldn't get it to open. And so I sent a quick email requesting that um, report and I will forward that along to the board um, so that we can all take a look at that. But they, you know, for our purposes, they are having these conversations now. And so I think, you know, if we can find a way to coordinate the conversation about growth and the conversation about a new building and maybe how we're going to fund some of these larger projects, I think all of these conversations should probably um, be happening together. I would agree. All right. And again, it's like, so I don't, I don't mean to just leave it hanging there. So I don't know how to move that forward or whose role that is to move that forward. Um, and so I guess that would be um, my question to you, Leanne. Um, 
That is a good question. I don't know if you have the bandwidth as the liaison to be able to take that on. Um, if maybe it should be somebody from the building steering committee initially where we were looking at enrollment um, or if someone from long range would pick that up. And I think that is something that we should, I don't know if we wanna toss coins for it, draw straws for it. <laughs> um, personally, I know that it, there's a lot on everybody's plate Ideally, the building steering committee would have somebody who could go in be part of that discussion. They know this data inside and out. They've been engaged. They've talked about um, the future plans, everything disappeared. Um, and that might be a big help. Um, just a thought. Don't waiting? everybody jump at once and say you're volunteering. Are we waiting for someone to volunteer? Do you, do you mean like a board <laughs> member on the boarding building steering committee or like yes. the chair? Oh. oh. Yeah, I'm asking either you or Alicia if you had bandwidth to do that. Hmm. Hillary does. Alicia does, I think. Nope. She was raising her hand. <laughs> I'll do it. Thank you, Sarah. I really you know, appreciate that. There's not, there's no budget stuff going on, so <laughs> I have plenty of time. Yeah, you know, and again, it can be. We can tag team this. You know, we can look at it as, you know, yeah, let's Hillary see what happens. Volunteered to do it with me. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Who, who did? I missed that. I was. I, I can well, also be available if needed, <laughs> but if we're covered, then. Maybe I will put them on my plate also. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want me to go to the next slide? How, you guys can't see us? Um, I can see you now. You're back. And I can see on the YouTube, I'm able to see um, the slide. So I think we're good. Okay. If you're ready. I say move on. Okay, so um, I have a update for negotiations. Um, the last time we, oh. okay, should I just go? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Sorry, I'm also we'll figure computer out. Computer keeps. Oh really? Oh okay, never mind then. Um, Okay, so um, the last time we talked, I think we had, um, I had told you that we were meeting um, on concessions that would hopefully help the district um, save some money and retain some of the things that um, were on our list um, be due to the budget constraints. Um, so the update is that we did talk to everybody. Um, the educational, the, so the ESP contract is like the ed techs and the secretarial um, staff and um, their contract was actually up. And so what they proposed was um, a one year contract with no language changes um, just to get through this year um, with uh, raise that um, we negotiated to be deferred for six months, meaning that um, at the end of their the term of this new contract, they will be at their uh, um, full raise amount of 3.5%. Um, but for the first six months, they will be saving the money on that raise amount of 3.5%. Um, and then obviously that, okay, so then I'll get into that later. Then, um, then the administrators who are a bargaining group, um, a pretty small bargaining group, um, when I say administrators, it's really just principals, vice principals, um, athletic director. It's, I don't know how many of, like 10, it, it's a very small group. It doesn't include central office. Um, and so what they agreed to, they also, we also were able to come to an agreement with the administrators. They had, um, a portion of their raise um, was deferred for six months um, in this year's contract. And then we agreed to a one-year contract for the following year. Um, similarly, it has no language changes. Um, and that was, again, to um, account for the fact that really nobody, everybody has um, 
a lot of stuff going on this year and that um, it might be good to um, not get into a full negotiation. Um, so that was agreed upon. Um, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent um, and the central office staff, they don't have a bargaining group that, that we work with. They, they are on contracts, um, but they're offered, is it a year at a time or two years at a time? Two, two. okay, so they're offered contracts two years at a time. Um, but they don't bargain for their contracts um, as a part of a bargaining group. But they also, um, similar to the administrators, agreed to have a portion of their raise deferred for six months um, for this year. Um, and then we did meet with the bus drivers and the custodian and food service employees, and we were not able to reach an agreement um, for any concessions um, there. And then with the teachers, which, as you know, are the largest bargaining group and account for the most amount of money um, and or savings, um, we were able to negotiate a tentative agreement with their um, negotiations team. Um, that would have been for a partial raise deferment, um, again, for six months. Um, their association had to vote on that because it was a change to their contract. And they voted no. So um, no concessions would be made by the teachers. Um, but we would like to thank the, the ESPs, the administrators, and um, all of the central office staff for, um, for their agreement um, to do that. And then I just wanted to update you on the, just in general, the um, collective bargaining agreements we have and what their terms now are. Some of them have changed. So the teachers remain um, 2019 through 2022. That one was the one that was just agreed upon. Um, the ed tax or the ESP contract is now a one-year contract from 2020 to 2021. Um, the admin is, um, they'll finish out this contract and then they also have a one-year contract from 2021 to 2022. And then the bus drivers and the custodians and food service employees um, both are, were 2018 through 2020, I mean, 2021. Um, so 2021, you guys are gonna have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I'll be gone, but I'll leave it to you. Um, so yeah, that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Thank you, Hillary. Oh, okay then. Um, 9.0 is making a motion to go into an executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 4056A to discuss a personnel matter to return to public session. So moved. Second. So moved. And if we can do the roll call vote. Oh, sure. Please. Mrs. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we will be back.
April, can you hear me this time? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I'm, oh, I'm not on my I, phone audio now. Yeah, no, I can. Hear you guys. Hi. Oh, good. Perfect. Um, I was having fun by myself with Miss Johnston. It was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stalking my dad's Facebook. Your dad's Oh, boy. That's a little dangerous. No, it's just like... You're, you're like very. So cool. and, and this is his laptop, and Facebook was just open. <laughs> so, you're on your dad's Facebook? You guys, we're live. Did you do a super inappropriate post? No, I was just looking at my aunt's Facebook because uh, she posts photos of me, and I want to see photos of myself. You should go around liking a bunch of stuff. And no, I can't. Not do that. Yes, that would be so fun. Like, like I'm All right. Oh, this calendar. All right. I believe everybody's back. Um, before we can move forward at all, probably should have done this before we went into executive session. It is after 9.30, and per board policy, uh, BE, no actions can be taken unless we vote to extend the meeting. Asking for a motion to extend beyond the 9.30 um, board limit for tonight. So move. So move. Second. And if we can, thank you. And if we can do a roll call vote. Mrs. Durgan. Yep. Mrs. Giftos. Yes. Dr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Yes. Ms. Layton. Yes. Mrs. Scyther. Yes. Mrs. Turner. Yes. Mr. Bennett. Yes. Excellent. All right, moving into new business. 10.1, it's approval of our meeting minutes from July 2nd, 2020. Move to approve as presented. So moved. Second. And if we can go into the roll call vote. Mrs. Durgan. Yes. Mrs. Giftos. Yes. Dr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Yes. Ms. Layton. Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. 10.2 are donation approvals. And I'm going to go ahead and read. We have two that I'd like to um, present to the board tonight. Um, the first one is... As we continue to navigate these challenging times, it's grateful to see the ongoing commitment of our community to reaching out and helping those in need. Since my last board update of May 7th, our friends and neighbors have continued to support the school nutrition backpack program with donations, some of which have, will now require our approval. Tom Boyles of Homer Sands Drive has donated $500 via RevTrack. The Governor William King Lodge 219, the Masons, have sent a check for $1,500. And the Rosbera brothers have pledged to donate $1,000 per month for 12 months, beginning in August 2020. Other smaller donations have come in as well, including $400 from the Scarborough Rotary Club, a total of $140 for the school nutrition program in general, and a total of $1,115 for the backpack program specifically. Special appreciations to those who have reached out with multiple donations, including Pat Bono, Belinda and Art Ledoux, Julie Caulfield, and John and Ruth Hughes. We respectfully request that the school board approve acceptance of these donations with our sincere thanks. Seat Fulton. Motion to approve as read. So moved. Second. Okay. All I can say is huge thank you. Um, this is incredible, especially um, given the situation that we're in, um, the economy as it is, your generosity continues to overwhelm me, Scarrow. Thank you so much for this donation. Any other discussion? Okay. If you could move to vote. Oh, oh. sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, wait, I missed one. That's why I was waiting. There was one more. Yeah, sorry. I was going to do them separately and then decided to put them back together. Um, this one is incredible as well. 
Eight Corners teacher Sarah Note has received a generous donation of $1,000 from a family friend to support her and her students as they return to school. And we respectfully request that the school board approve acceptance of this, this donation on behalf of Eight Corners School, again with many thanks from Kate Bolton. Motion to approve as read. So moved. Second. Ready to vote. Mrs. Yes. Durgan. Yes, and thank you. Mrs. Giftos. Yes, with our thanks. Dr. Gill. Yes, and thank you. Ms. Casalonis. Yes, and thank you. Ms. Leighton. Yes, thank you. Mrs. Sither. Yes, thank you. Mrs. Turner. Yes, thank you. And Mr. Bennett. Yes, and thank you. Excellent. Motion approves. 10.3. Sandy, this is going to be all you. We have a lot of appointments tonight. Okay. 10.3.1. Middle school seventh grade mathematics teacher Carrie Bracey has been chosen to fill this position created by a retirement. Ms. Bracey received a BS degree in business administration and management from Bloomsburg University in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, and she completed the extended teacher ed program at USM. Ms. Bracey was an intern in a second grade classroom in the Wyndham Primary School, and most recently was an intern and long-term sub at Gore Middle School with a focus on math and ELA. Ms. Bracey will be placed on step one of the bachelor's plus 15 scale for the collective bargain and agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Carrie Bracey as a middle school seventh grade mathematics teacher. Can we do all of these at once, Leanne? Sure. Keep going. Yeah. Yes, please. 10.3.2, middle school seventh grade social studies teacher, Rachel Smith has been selected to fill this position created by a retirement. Ms. Smith earned her BS, B of Arts degree in history from the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and her master's of education from Springfield College. Ms. Smith has been a middle school social studies teacher in both Virginia and South Carolina for 11 years. Ms. Smith will be placed on step 12 of the master scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Rachel Smith as a middle school seventh grade social studies teacher. 10.3.3, middle point school, middle school, middle school nurse. Amanda Eason has been chosen to fill this position created by a resignation. Mrs. Eason, earned her BS degree in nursing from the University of Rhode Island. She has practiced nursing since 2007 in both Florida and Maine. She is currently a clinical nurse at the Maine Medical Center. Mrs. Eason will be placed on step 14 of the bachelor's scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Amanda Eason as a middle school nurse. 10.3.4, high school social studies teacher. David Pay has been chosen to fill this created position created by a resignation. Mr. Pay received his Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from the University of Connecticut and his ETEP certificate from U USM. He began his career in the field of technology where he was a web developer for TD Bank for 15 years. He later became a high school social studies teacher and has been with Sanford High School for the past three years. Mr. Pay will be placed on the step four of the bachelor's plus 15 scale per the collective bargain and agreement. The recommendation is to appoint David Pay as a high school social studies teacher. 10.3.5, high school math teacher, Andrew Rice has been nominated to fill this position created by a resignation. Mr. Rice received his electrical engineering degree at Northeastern University and his Master's of Arts in Teaching Advanced Mathematics from George Fox University in Oregon. He has been teaching various high school math classes in Massachusetts, Oregon, and most recently in California. Mr. Rice will be placed on step eight of the master's scale per the collective bargain and agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Andrew Rice as a high school mathematics teacher. 10.3.6, high school STEM teacher, Carrie Kurtz has been chosen to fill this position created by a resignation. Mr. Kurtz received his BS degree in geolo geolo 
excuse me, geology science from the British College and secondary science certificate from Metropolitan State College. He has over 20 years of teaching physics, chemistry, geology, astronomy, and marine studies in Cape Elizabeth schools. Mr. Kurtz will be placed on step 21 of the bachelor's 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Kerry Kurtz as a high school STEM teacher. 10.3.7, high school English teacher Suzanne Mayer has been nominated to fill the position created by a resignation. Mrs. Mayer had received her bachelor's degree in English from Redford University in Virginia and her master's degree in literature and composition from the University of New Hampshire. She has been an English teacher at Shepherds High School for 21 years. Prior to that, she was a history teacher and a GED advisor with Scarborough Adult, Adult Ed Learning Center, as well as a language arts teacher for one year with Scarborough Middle School. Mrs. Maya will be placed on step 24 of the Masters Plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Susan Meyer at the high school in, as a high school English teacher. 10.3.8, high school English teacher. Burgess LePage has been chosen to fill this position created by a resignation, point six, and the one year leave of absence, point four. Ms. LePage obtained her Bachelor of Science degree in English from Bowdoin College. She has been both a middle school and high school English teacher for the past 11 years in Denver, Colorado. Ms. LePage will be placed on step 12 of the bachelor scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Burgess LePage as a .6 high school English teacher. 10.3.9, Blue Point School kindergarten teacher, Dara Kuroff has been selected to fill this newly created position. Ms. Kuroff earned her Bachelor of Science degree in elementary ed from Keene State College. She has been in Ed Tech 3 and Special Ed in Cumberland Center for two years. Ms. Kuroff will be placed on step one of the bachelor's scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Dara Kuroff as a Blue Point School kindergarten teacher. 10.3.10, Blue Point School kindergarten teacher Abby Randall has been selected to fill this position created by a resignation. Ms. Randall obtained her BS degree of elementary ed from the University of Maine in Farmington and is completing her Master's of Ed in Instructional Technology at the University of Maine in Orono. Ms. Randall taught second grade for two years in Auburn and most recently has been teaching first grade at Green Central School in Green. Ms. Randall will be placed on step six of the bachelor's plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Abby Randall as a Blue Point School kindergarten teacher. 10.3.11, Blue Point School nurse. Lori Hibbard has been nominated to fill this newly created position. Mrs. Hibbard earned her, her bachelor's of science degree in biology from St. Lawrence University and the her nursing degree from Southern Maine Community College. She has been a research program coordinator at the Maine Medical Center Biobank for six years, and most recently has been a clinical nurse with Intermed for the past three years. Mrs. Hibbert will be placed on step five of the bachelor's plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Lori Hibbert as a Blue Point School nurse. 10.3.3. 12, Pleasant Hill School second grade teacher, Brittany Asha has been chosen to fill this newly created position. Ms. Asha received a bachelor's of art degree from the English, in English from the University of Southern Maine where she is also working toward, toward her master's degree in special, special aid. She has been a second grade teacher in Lewiston for the past two years. Ms. Asha will be placed on step three of the bachelor's plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. 10.3.13, Pleasant Hill School Nurse. Doris Groshen has been chosen to fill this position created by resignation. Mrs. Groshen has received her BS degree in nursing from the University of Southern Maine. She has been a clinical nurse at the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital 
in Maine Medical Center for 13 years. Mrs. Groshen will be placed on step 14 of the bachelor's plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Doris Groshen as a Pleasant Hill School nurse. 10.314, Eight Corner School first grade teacher. Colleen Hackew has been nominated to fill this newly, this position newly created, excuse me, to fill this newly created position. Mrs. Hackey received her Bachelor's of Arts degree in early childhood education and her Master's of Education in Curriculum and Instruction from Boston College. Mrs. Hackey has been a pre-kindergarten teacher as well as a kindergarten and first grade teacher, all at St. Mary of the Assumption School in Brooklyn, Mass. Most recently, she has been there as an assistant principal for the past two years. Mrs. Hackey will be placed on step 10 of the massive scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Colleen Hackey as an eight corner school first grade teacher. 10.3.15, eight corner school nurse, Rebecca Cummins has been selected to this newly created position. Ms. Cummins received a BS degree in nursing from the University of Phoenix. She was a school nurse in RSU 14 for, 19, for nine years. She also has been a medical specialist for the United States Army for four years. Ms. Cummins will be placed on step 14 of the bachelor scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The re recommendation is to appoint Rebecca Cummins as the eight corner school nurse. And that is it. Ooh. That was a lot, you've been busy. Um, motion to approve the very many new appointments. So moved. Second. Thank Second. you. <laughs> I think we're ready to vote. Oh, oh I, Nick. Yeah, I just wanted to say each, each time we do this, and there's 15 of them this time, it, it always amazes me how many new hires we have coming into our district with advanced degrees. And it's, I think it's really exciting for our students and for our community to be attracting such a, such a well-qualified group of new applicants. So a great list of, of um, new additions to our district. Thank you. Mrs. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes, and welcome to the district. Ms. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes, and congrats. 10.4, um, reviewing the calendar changes for the K-2 start. I believe there's a slide and Diane, I'm going to ask for some assistance on this. I'm not sure if it is, if we're readjusting or if we're accepting the recommendation. So earlier this evening, when we heard all of the building leaders talk about their intentions for the beginning of the school year, you heard the K to two principals speak about a shift in their original thinking um, of what our plans for the beginning of the school year usually look like given this very different time that we're coming into school. And so um, I think that if you take a look at the screen, you can see um, as described by Mrs. Steele earlier this evening, the intention would be instead of having short uh, 30 minute appointments with each student that was intended for screening uh, when the original calendar was proposed. At this point, they would like to have small groups of students coming in with their, coming into school for a half a day to um, get acclimated to the school, to learn about the basic practices and routines, um, and also to get acclimated with their devices. Uh, because they will all be taking home Chromebooks this year and the, um, they want them to feel comfortable with those. And so you can see um, what's proposed there. Be willing to take questions if people still have those. So basically there's, there's a, 
change to how the 8th through the 11th will be utilized, but the academic calendar itself is the same. That's correct. We okay. just felt that whereas the original calendar had said by appointment, um, right. that is no longer accurate, and we want to make sure that the calendar that we have published um, does accurately reflect the programming that we would have in place for our students. Perfect. But just to clarify, Diane, the original calendar, which were the appointment days? The 8th and the 9th? I believe it was the 8th, 9th, and 10th. Is that correct, Kelly? Yes. And the 11th is a Friday? Mm -hmm. The 11th is a Friday. Okay, so they would have had one day of school, basically? That's correct. Okay. You don't have to go about one day of school. Just as a quick comment, um, I really want to thank the K2 team for making this modification. I think it's it's going to be nice for the students to have that opportunity to have the small groups to get to see other students doing this. Um, might take a little of the, the fear of coming into a new building, um, make it a little different given how unique this situation is. Um, I think it gives a little more normalcy, so I'm really impressed with this, and thank you for the creativity. I will certainly pass that along. So based on that, um, knowing that there is going to be a change to the language and a change to Hillary's point on Friday the 11th, motion to approve the changes as presented. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Mrs. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. All right. Last but not least is 11.0, which is our adjournment. Um, before I call for the actual vote on that, I know tonight was a long night. Um, I want to thank all of our administrators for coming in. Um, it, this was a very comprehensive overview. Every time we hear more about um, the plans for our students reopening, I feel a little bit better. I hope the community is also um, feeling more confident in the plans and as they're being um, unveiled to us. Um, thank you again for all of the hard work as we get closer to the school's opening. And with that, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Ms. Skiptos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Have a good evening. Why are Thanks, you everyone. Good night. Alphabetically, you should be first.